so thanks everybody. Uh, thank you especially um, for this unprecedented uh, live stream of Zoom school board meeting. I call it to order officially here at 641 on uh, April 7th, 2020, the um, Board of Education School Board meeting call to order. Uh, we are now uh, moving forward and thanks everybody who is joining us and especially to our technology team here to get this actually working in light of this unprecedented time in our history. So with that, I will move us to uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, um, Mr. Matsuoka. All right, you can all remain seated if that keeps your face in the, the camera and there's a flag behind me. Excellent. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. The United, United States, States of America, America. <laughs> and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for Okay, so then we'll move to item two, which is announcement of closed session actions. And I have a few of those. Uh, we have. Oh, me... Hey, Laura. Yeah. Sandra needs to do the Spanish interpretation announcement. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Um, tenemos interpretación al español si desean oprime el botón de interpretación localizado en la barra de herramientas que se encuentra en la parte de abajo en su pantalla. Gracias. Okay. Okay, okay we're going to move to the two uh, closed session items. Thank you, Sandra, um, that need to be reported out are items B4 and B5. And so first on the item B4, um, the the board in closed session approved the the resignation agreement of a classified employee of the amount of forty five hundred. Uh, Miss Sims Moten made the motion. Miss Ford seconded, and the vote was unanimous. Unanimous tonight is four because of the absence uh, due to illness to a cold of Miss Munoz. So that um, motion carried. Before. Um, item B5, moving on next, um, the, the uh, motion was made to accept the recommendation, excuse me, just zooming around here, um, to, to fill the position of assistant principal at Santa Barbara High School. Uh, Daniel DuPont. Uh, I myself made the motion. Ms. Sims Moten seconded and the vote was unanimous. Um, second part of that item was uh, the appointment of the Dean of Students at Dos Pueblos, will, which will be given to Bethany Bodenhammer. Uh, the motion was carried by myself and seconded by Dr. Reed and it was unanimous. And now we can move on to the next item which is the superintendent's report, Mr. Matsuoka. Well, good evening board. And I see many of our staff and I know our community is watching. Um, what an unprecedented time this is for us as a community, as, uh, as a nation, really as a globe. Um, a lot of hard work's going on, um, both inside of our district, out in the community. Um, Prayers and best wishes to all people on the front lines, our healthcare workers, and, and people are attending to those who have deep needs. Um, the it seems like the the public distancing is starting to make a difference in the state of California. Um, in spite of the statistics that are growing, I do see some progress um, in the data, and, and hopefully we'll we'll see that difference unfold in the coming weeks. So just incredible time, proud of our staff who's responded really on just such short notice to a, a complete change and flip in, in how we do teaching and learning. So appreciations go out to our staff um, and to our parents who in many cases are now the, the teachers of their children. And so we wish, we wish everybody well in the community and we'll keep extending and growing our support as the weeks go by. And then as part of my report, we have two uh, introductions to make to the school board. And so the first one is we'd like to introduce Matthew Dittman, who is our new director of food service. What a moment that he has stepped into. Um, and we've asked Matt to join um, via Zoom. So 
We'll invite Matt to just share a brief introduction of himself and then invite the board to offer some comments to Mr. Dittman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Dittman. Uh, yeah, the fifth day of my first week was March 13th. That was uh, when school was canceled. So you can imagine uh, it was quite a challenge. That might be something of an understatement. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have uh, been able to do what we have done. Uh, because of the efforts of the entire uh, food service staff, which I'm kind of blown away with. Uh, and it's not just the food service staff, it's also the district at large. Everyone's been so welcoming and encouraging and helpful that uh, uh, I'm really excited, really grateful to be uh, working in this district. So a little bit about me. Um, I come uh, at this job kind of from two passions, education and food service. I've been in the private sector working in food service for almost 20 years, uh, working every conceivable job in that field. And then for the past five years, I've been teaching at the City College in the philosophy department. Um, currently, I teach uh, comparative world religions, so it's pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> and so I bring both of those perspectives to uh, this job. And I feel privileged to take on this responsibility and look forward to uh, uh, serving our community to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And I just want to give you, this is, you know, uh, the opportunity and the challenge that you've risen to in the few weeks, and as well as the staff and the warehouse and accounting and payroll and the ways in which everybody as a team had to come together to make sure with a strong commitment from all from all staff and, and from the board that kids rely on our meals need to get them. And I'm just really pleased and, and grateful that you stepped in and uh, I've gotten good feedback from our, some of our nonprofit partners about the service. And, and we just need to continue to get the word out because we're not feeding as many kids as, as do rely on our food during the regular um, school year. Um, so I just want to thank you and your whole team and welcome you aboard. Thank you. Uh, our second introduction is the next principal for Roosevelt Elementary School. We were fortunate to complete that interview process before um, the world went crazy on us. And so you see the image of Valerie Galindo and um, Valerie is well known to us. She spent the majority of her career in Santa Barbara. And so we welcome her as the next principal of Roosevelt Elementary. I'll invite Valerie to share some introductions of herself and then board can offer comments. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, it's such an honor to serve the students of Santa Barbara and their families and this wonderful community. Believe it or not, I began my journey in this district nearly 25 or 20 years ago as a classified employee. At the time, I wasn't aware that I would dedicate my life to serving the students and families of Santa Barbara. However, it didn't take me long to realize that I did want to devote my life to a career in education. In my time with the district, I have acted as an instructional assistant, playground supervisor, office assistant, first and seventh grade teacher, PLC lead, member of many a committee, and assistant principal for two elementary schools. These, role, these roles have definitely shaped me into the school leader I am today. Each and every day, my goal is to empower all members of our school community with the knowledge and sense of connection that compels them to engage in not only our local, but our global community. This has been shaped and supported by Santa Barbara Unified School District's commitment to ensure equity and student achievement outcomes, to create safe and affirming learning environments, and to provide a relevant and inclusive learning experience for all students. The challenge of uniting a diverse student body to prepare students for their futures is both a familiar and energizing challenge to me. Teamwork is a common theme in my career. Together, a committed team of teachers, leaders, families, and staff cultivates a climate of success for all its students. How? By slowly and methodically building upon their own in other words, the community begins to believe in its own power to build and achieve change. This mindset and dedication, I approach my role as principal of Roosevelt. These have been 
a mix of joy and excitement about the upcoming role at Roosevelt, coupled with the uncertainty of a global pandemic. This pandemic is serious and deserves our attention, but that doesn't mean it must define us as a community. My grandmother and her sister were students at Roosevelt nearly a century ago. I grew up hearing their stories about the 1925 earthquake and the resilience of our community. Our collective strength has not changed. We will get through this. We're a school that not only cares deeply for our students, but for one another. Together, our community will continue to build upon this collective strength with a shared commitment to one another and the future of our students. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ms. Galindo. I just have to say, and other, uh, I will speak as a, as a Rough Rider mom and an alum, uh, we're so excited to have you and your story that you sent out to all parents through Parent Square about your grandmother. I read that to my son who's in third grade there and he was really intrigued. And that's a really important historical point that we've, we've been through tough times and we'll get through this. And, and your connection to Roosevelt uh, speaks volumes. So thank you. Thank you for that nice speech as well. You're welcome. Hi, Valerie. This is Wendy. So we met in Core Knowledge those many years ago and uh, certainly experienced all your bundle of energy, uh, even in seventh graders, maybe more than they could take. But you certainly, uh, it would be good for the little ones that we have lots of energy that will be welcoming you on. So thank you. And it's so good to hear your journey through the Santa Barbara Unified School District, you know, both as student and then certainly uh, as a teacher. And so to see you come full circle is really good to see you. So congratulations and thank you for being part of our team. Thank you. Mr. Matsuoka, are you, uh, any, any further comments to your report? Uh, no, that concludes my superintendent comments. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, okay. Sorry, I have just about 50 screens open. So forgive me here <laughs> as we move through this unprecedented way of doing a board meeting. Um, so now we have a uh, board comments and correspondence, and I would like it to turn it over to my colleagues, but first just want to acknowledge um, all in the public that has joined us, the, just the unprecedented nature and the flexibility and the fact that we're able to meet like this uh, due to the governor's orders that, that meetings do need to continue, but to have our safety and all of our safety on our families and the most vulnerable in our community um, be safe. And that's why we're conducting this meeting this way and the technology that, that supports it and the staff that put through literally, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step script and all of the ways that this is actually working tonight is quite remarkable. So we're doing it. We're moving forward. We're taking one step at a time and we're um, making important changes so that we give students a chance and an education at each day here in this new, as I said earlier, historic um, reality. I uh, just want to, again, thank the 33 or so people uh, in the public who have joined us. That means a lot that you've taken the time to figure out how to do that and be with us. And we'll make this as um, uh, your input is really important. And so we'll, we'll get to that soon. But I just wanted to thank everybody, staff, team, board members, and the public that have joined us and move it forward to our, um, our board to provide comments and correspondence. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Ms. Ford, go for it. I'm trying to. I'm trying to be a good student and raise my hand. I just wasn't. I uh, had to scroll over to get to you. Let's see. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Well, um, wow. I just want to express my deep appreciation to the entire district team. Um, I think that those of us who are in education know that public schools aren't always what I'd say the most nimble uh, organizations. We have so many pre processes, procedures, policies, ed code, sometimes they slow us down in doing what's right at the right time, but not this time, not in this district. The entire district team has been creative and responsive, collaborative and determined to solve a multitude of problems. And we probably only know a few of them, um, just determined to make things happen in the absolute shortest amount of time. I know for certain there are many, many districts around the state that aren't starting distance learning for at least two more weeks. 
There are many districts around the state that are close to giving up on the internet and on, on laptop access and food services for kids, but not SBUSD. And many districts are struggling because the relationship between the district and the employee unions is also rather broken, but not here. So I just want to say thank you. In a time when lots of people are saying can't, 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 this district is saying can, can, can. It means a lot to me and makes me feel very proud. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Uh, Ms. Dr. Reed. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Ms. Ford, and thank you, Ms. Caps, for um, launching us into this <laughs> new new arena, which uh, hopefully we're not going to be in it too much longer, but it sounds like we might be. But um, I just wanted to say that um, really ever since this COVID-19 virus penetrated our world, we've just been challenged with reorganizing our lives, both personally and professionally, and dealing with the daily uncertainties um, that rise up as we lose the ability to freely do the simple tasks in our lives and losing the freedoms we once had. But it's times like this that we really need to take stock in what we do have. Um, we have a superintendent and district cabinet working 24 seven to do the best for our teachers, staff, students, and families, striving to be nimble, as Kate had said, in these fluid times and navigating situations that are still yet to be realized. We have teachers dedicated to taking on the challenges of remote teaching and learning, even as these new platforms are being reformulated on a daily basis, and while in the midst of taking care of their own children and families' needs, all under one roof. We have an administrative staff handling the efforts to ensure our students are fed, employees are paid, and we're supported during this difficult time. But finally, and actually I wanna acknowledge the family and the community out there and those who are here with us today. Um, and most importantly, we have families and parents willing to support our students, their children, to ensure their success during this difficult time. So though this is unprecedented, I agree with Ms. Ford, we are in a district that is making inroads and changes to support our students, and I appreciate all that they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. There you are, uh, Ms. Sims Oten. Hi, thank you. I'll just keep this short. I just want to echo certainly the comments of my board colleagues. And, and I would just add that I always just say I'm so proud to be part of SBUSD. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else and being a board member as part of this system. And it just shows through this process what we can do when we need to do. And that's because we have the right folks in the right place at the right time. And nothing works unless all those three are working together. So I want to share my appreciation out to the superintendent, certainly out to our cabinet and our staff and all the teachers. And I also want to honor the students as well, that they're being how they're working through this whole process and being patient through it all and, and sticking through it. And I appreciate the comment, um, Ms. Ford, about not here. We're saying, yes, we can do this. And as I was looking through, one of the elevations that came through was the need for childcare. Um, that got so elevated in that and so taking a look at it. And, and what I realized is that the school districts are the anchor in this community. And it was haven't been more evident than through this process. We are an anchor here. We feed the families. The families is here where they get connected. So I, again, want just to share my appreciation for all the hard work. You show up every day uh, in the midst of all this, ready to work and making sure that our students have a continu uh, good continued learning environment. So I just really want to just say thank you and that I really am proud to be part of Santa Barbara USD. Thank you. Okay, thanks to the board uh, for those comments. And so now I'm going to turn it over to the public to make their comment, I believe. And thank you to Sandra Trujillo who has done an excellent job of coordinating all of this. And an, again, a new unprecedented way of doing public comment. Um, but I believe, and I'm gonna have Jack, Dr. Reed help me out here. I believe that there's just one speaker uh, for public comment on non-agenda items. That's correct. Um, so we have Karen McBride, which I will be calling right now. One second. 
So just to explain to those who might be joining, um, those who we, we receive many emails and those are all part of the public record and have been received. But uh, we also put out the option if people wanted to call in, we would give them a call at the appropriate time. So again, I believe we're doing as much as we can to uh, make this an inclusive uh, participatory meeting. Hi, you are on speaker with the board. Um, And you have you have three minutes to speak, and I will let you know when you have thirty seconds. Okay, Karen McBride, I'm the president of Santa Barbara Teachers Association. Um, first, I just want to thank the district leadership team for their timely and sensitive concern for the safety of our students and our staff. And um, I I represent the members of Santa Barbara uh, Teachers Association when I sincerely say that we recognize all of the hard work that you have done and and the fact you're probably working seven days a week, um, especially as the guidance from the state level is continually changing and collaboration with the county and uh, partner districts is, I know, difficult at best right now with all of the um, the online communication that we need to do so i really appreciate that and i just want to continue to encourage the open dialogue and that exists between the union and um, the district and i want to let you know that for my part through this stressful time um, i find myself continuing to offer members encouragement and ideas for maintaining and improving communication even though uh, i'm no text guru but um you know, I can offer, uh, I can just offer ideas for, for questions for improving um, communications and, and encouraging them to ask their questions because I know there's so much uncertainty right now. Um, and I also, um, I really appreciate your comments, Kate, where you were speaking to the fact that um, leaders and staff have had to be so creative and responsive and collaborative. And so I just want to add emphasis to that relationship between the district and, and the employees. 30 seconds. And say that, thank you, say that we need to um, continue to um, make clear what it is that our expectations are of employees and, and um, what protections that we have. So, um, I just want to continue to encourage that collaboration, and I think that we're all going to come out of this stronger. So thank you for thank all you. the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe that, thank you, uh, Ms. McBride, I believe that ends our close our uh, public comment on non-agenda items. And so we will move forward. Um, with the uh, one of my favorite moments of the meeting, uh, a D acceptance of donations. I need a motion. So moved. Uh, Ms. Ford, second. I see with her hand. Uh, raised. I was wondering if I could just ask a question. Certainly. About it. Um, I saw it was sixteen thousand dollars for professional development at San Marcos. And I just wondered if um, Ms. Carey would have some guidance on what that might be used for or what it's earmarked for. A lot of money. Let's see if Ms. Carey can join us here. I hear you the question. I'm gonna um, request permission to circle back around with that response at an appropriate time in tonight's agenda. Sounds good. Um, sure, then I'll, say, I'll second the motion. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Aries, with gratitude. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on. We are now going to um, item E, consent agenda. Does, do any of my board members want to pull um, any agenda items from consent? I actually have one that I wanted to just get clarification um, from Mr. Tay or Ms. Mr. Rickman on, which is the Khan Academy uh, 
contract. I believe that's item eight. Yeah, what, what would you like to know? Um, there was a question from a parent about um, the privacy and um, I thought it was, was worth discussion, brief discussion um, about, about, I just wanted some more context about this, um, about this contract and whether or not, um, because it is, it does detail sharing of information, uh, whether or not parents have the opportunity to opt out. So the short answer is no, they don't have an opportunity to opt out. Um, this is a boilerplate contract that was created by SETPA, which is an organization of um, school districts and, and vetted by the attorney general of the state. It's the same, um, it's the same uh, language that's used by almost every tech ed tech firm in the state that has signed on to this agreement around privacy for students. Um, and so uh, it's what we use for, for everything. Uh, in fact, we only sign contracts with uh, companies that have signed on to um, this boilerplate language since the state of California was one of the first states to really take on student privacy. Um, so it's the one we use for everything. Okay, can you just speak a little more generally? Is this for Khan Academy? Um, is this just a resource that was provided or is this required? So anytime a student logs into any system, we have to have a privacy agreement in place. Sure. Uh, so, so teachers use systems all the time that kids don't log into. But anytime yeah. we're having a kid log into a system, a student log into a system, we need a privacy agreement in place with that, with that company. Okay, so, so if a student is not logging into Khan Academy, then this, their information would not be shared. Right, and, and um, again, their information is not being shared uh, with any company other than uh, Khan Academy. Okay. Well, under, maybe... the, under, under the laws that govern uh, student privacy in the state of California and the federal government. Okay, sure. Thank you. I don't want to hold this up, but and maybe um, I've sent in uh, to, to Ms. Jate the question. Maybe we can just provide a little bit more details to the parent. I can get back to her if that's okay. But thank you. I don't need to. Yeah, I'm very familiar with this parent. We get, we'll, we'll reach out to her. Okay. Thank you so much. That's it for me on, in terms of uh, consent agenda items. Does anybody, any other board members have any questions or anything that they wanted to clarify? Okay. I just need a motion. Motion to accept the consent agenda items. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Second. Thank you, Ms. sims uh, All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, great. Moving on to the action agenda. Um, item F1, request for adoption of two secondary textbooks, International Baccalaureate Program. Ms. Carey. Uh, good evening, board, President Caps, cabinet members, and community. Um, as I've brought to you before, these requests for textbooks, I'll just say a comment about each one. The first one is associated with the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, the proliferation of courses helps to diversify options for students per pursuing the IB diploma. And so this is the text that would accompany the math applications course. The second one is an AP government text. Uh, the College Board recently underwent a course revision for AP Gov. And so um, in our Ed Services Department, we facilitated uh, teachers uh, review of and recommendation for this text for AP Gov. So we are requesting, um, a cer certainly open to any questions or, or uh, needs for clarification you might have and otherwise we'd be bringing this back on the consent agenda next meeting. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments from the board? I'll clarify that it's action. So we would not be bringing it back. We're asking for action tonight. I'm realizing that. <laughs> That's right. So we need a motion to approve the request for adoption of two secondary textbooks. Happy to make that motion. Ms. Ford, thank you. Second? I'll second it. Dr. Reed, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, F2, approval of two, a new certified job description, Dr. Becchio. All right, well, good evening, board members. Um, 
Thank you for this opportunity to bring before you a job description for a new certificated position. Um, let me give you a little bit of background and, and Principal Binkley you'll notice is here uh, with us. So um, if there are some more detailed questions, she, she'd be happy to uh, chime in and answer. Um, there is a art uh, vacancy at uh, Harding uh, School for 2021. Uh, Ms. Binkley has uh, put together a team of uh, community stakeholders, uh, mo including the MOXIE, DPEA, um, UCSB, and some of her parents and teachers or staff members. And they have um, kind of designed a vision for their art program over at Harding. And in order to carry out that vision, um, she um, has put forward this idea of hiring a STEAM art and design teacher. Hence the job description that I attached in your documents for you to, to review. Um, th this position is really focused on, on art and it does require, you'll notice in the description that they have a authorization in art, but it also, want, um, it also is designed to incorporate in engineering, math, science, and, and some design concepts into the art program. And, um, and so uh, this is what's before you. It is not an additional position at Harding. Um, it is a already budgeted art position that um, we have at that school. So I'm happy to take any questions or if you have questions for Principal Binkley, she's available. Thank you, questions or comments? Uh, Ms. sims Wotan, I can't hear you. Ms. Sims Moten. Wendy, you're, you're on. Yeah, Wendy, you're, you're muted. Oh, I thought I did that. It's hard to keep me quiet. So, you know, this is a button that helps that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, toward the end of your comments, uh, John, because my question was, is this already a budgeted position? And maybe you said that and I didn't hear it. Yeah, I did comment to that. It's um, there. There's a budgeted art position at every elementary school. And this, there is a vacancy there um as there was a resignation and so therefore um th when we go out to hire we would like to put out this job description upon your approval um and look for a teacher that's able to implement um, some of the vision that that team over there has designed for their art program okay thank you thank you for that yep yeah dr reed i, I just wanted to say it looks like an exciting um opportunity for for the school and um this design, the steam art and design. I mean, I think it sounds really incredible. Um, was this um, was this uh, something that's been in the works in design for a while? Yeah. So um, I began this vision with UCSB uh, probably towards the end of last year. Um, we we were we we just feel like our school is really in need and ready for um, opportunities for, you know, more critical thinking, more creativity, more um, innovation, and um, I have been really inspired by um, those Pueblos and what's happening over there, as well as what's happened at Adams and Franklin. And, you know, we feel like we're ripe, we're ready, and um, feel like it will only enhance what we've already begun and add an opportunity for our students to contribute and develop more um, scientific and mathematical thinking, as well as improving engineering and language skills. There's so many things. It's all um, just a win-win. So we have a great team and uh, that's comprised of not only professionals around Santa Barbara, um, but also parents and UCSB as well. So um, I have a feeling that this is going to really be an asset to our community. Well, it sounds like it. I just appreciate the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach and the way you're, you're it just, it's, it's integrated with everything. It just sounds like you've got the whole, the whole package. So I look forward to hearing more about it as it unfolds. Thank you. Excellent. You will. Yeah, I agree. I'm intrigued by it uh, very much and excited by it. So well, with that, we need a motion unless there's any other comment. I don't, don't, don't believe there is. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Reed. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye.
Thank you, Ms. Binkley. Thank you, Dr. Becchio. And now uh, Thank you. moving to item F3. Again, Dr. Becchio, the approval of coordinator of school safety and climate job description. All right. Thank you. So this um, item comes to you um, really to fill um, in part the void that's going to be left by Kelly um, Moore, who's been with us in the uh, safety um, coordinator position for the last couple of years. And um, I just want to say, we all know the work um, that Kelly's done and he's, he is definitely going to be missed. He's done some great systems work around school safety and disaster preparedness. Um, what we did is um, worked, uh, Fran worked with the team around how to fill that void. And um, what this job description is um, a certificated uh, management position um, that is different from what Kelly's is. Kelly's was a, a classified management position. Um, the idea here is that we want to, Fran is going to take on um, a lot of the systems work and um, higher level work that Ke Kelly was doing around school safety and, and disaster preparedness. Um, but in order to do that and still carry out that vision, she needs to have someone that's able to um, do some of the day-to-day -day operations around student services that um, are in the job description. For example, um, some of the uh, attendance issues, working with families, the SARB process, working on student discipline cases, expulsion, um, working with deans and assistant principals in the school setting. And so um, really in order to do that, we need a certificated management position and hence why we've changed it from classified to certificated. Um, so that's that's the vision for this um, position, and um, and so I'm happy to entertain any questions. Also, Dr. Wagnex here with us, so she can answer questions as well. Thank you, Dr. Becky. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Ms. Sims Wanton. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to comment on how critical this position is. We know about a year and a half ago, we were looking at to ensure the safety, you know, of our students in our campuses and just the community in general. So I want to appreciate uh, certainly the work that Kelly did and he started and, and you know, made that foundation. And I certainly um, support this, this moving this to a um, a certificated managed position, I'm hoping in terms of be able to increase what even what Kelly was doing. So I appreciate that and knowing that a year and a half ago, we were struggling just to get this position here. And so now that we have it and, and the great work that Kelly has started, then we can continue that on. Thank you. Ms. Ford. Oh, thanks so much. This looks like a really great job, I must say. <laughs> but I was wondering if you guys would consider a couple other additions to it. Given that it's an administrative position and a certificated position, um, I didn't see any kind of a note about um, having supervisory responsibility for one or more certificated or classified employee. And I think whether that happens right away or never or whatever, I'd put it in the job description because it is something that for me, I'd want to be looking for in this kind of, uh, in the best candidate. And also along those lines, I think it would be really great that the person should have had school site administration experience, particularly as it refers to uh, crisis management, uh, student behavior, um, culture building, etc. I just, um, I think this person would, well, I, I'm sure there are lots of good people in the district but they should have school experience, um, in my opinion. Ms. Wagner, what do you think? Um, I completely agree with you, and, um, and that's in my mind in terms of hiring, that yes, you'd need someone who had school side administrative experience and someone who'd worked in school climate and safety before. Um, and had exposure to that. I also agree on the, the, the oversight of certificated and classified. I, I don't know that initially there will be any um, direct supervisorial, like uh, the direct supervisor of anyone who's certificated, but we do have some classified employees who they would uh, help provide supervision of. So thank you for that suggestion. If I could just comment that um, I would, um, just for the board, I would fully support both of those additions to this job description. So if, if there were a um, motion, I would, I would love for it to include um, with those two items and I'll add those into the job description. 
Thanks. Thank I'd you. like to make a motion to accept the job description. I will second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're moving to item F4, approval of second amendment uh, to assistant superintendent employment agreement. And I believe that we have public comment on this item. Uh, Sandra. That's correct. Give me just one second. Sure. Okay, okay um, Ms. Caps, we have Peggy Wilson, and uh, Ms. Wilson, I will give you three minutes to speak, and I will let you know um, when you have 30 seconds. Okay, go ahead. Okay, okay, great. Hello, board members and um, superintendents. My name is Peggy Wilson, and I live here in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, my kids went to through the Santa Barbara School District. Can you guys hear me okay? Somebody wave. Yes. If you can hear me. Okay, shake your head. Great, thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm here to actually um, oppose the contract extensions for John Becchio and Sean Carney. And I'm here to oppose them. I, I kind of want to use the board's own words and everyone's words that have been speaking so far. They've talked about we're in unprecedented times, uh, challenging. We're reorganizing. We're operating in new territory. So with that being said, I see no reason to uh, move ahead with, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, extending the contracts right now. I think we need to wait till we can have a public setting where everyone can come, all voices can be heard. I think that's really important. Um, I really look to the board to be the stewards of what's happening here. And um, so, and, and part of my concern, I just have to say, comes from dealing with this sex education uh, curriculum where it seems like it was such a rush and uh, to get things done and the board was just rushed because Dr. Rowdy was pushing her. And it's like, we have time now board members to get the community together over the summer, look at both those curriculums. I think it would be very redeeming for you as a board to the community to show that you are open to hearing both sides. You had an unprecedented amount of people at that board meeting opposing it. So all being said and done, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm opposed to doing that right now. I think there's been a lot of errors happening in the school district. I know there's been mismanagement of the LCAP funds. Uh, I know the um, special ed program has been waning. Um, what else? I, oh my gosh, the, um, uh, what is that? The violence, a 41% increase. So I just think we need to take a pause and a breath, get back on track, allow all the community to- 30 seconds. Together. And I'm really looking to you board members to do what's right. Be the stewards of the education system. Be the gatekeepers. Do the right thing here. Wait for all the community and don't go ahead and do this. There's a new superintendent coming. He's going to look around and, you know, things are going to change. The, you know, votes are going to happen. Probably going to be new board members. I mean, all kinds of things. There's no reason to go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next we'll have Sheridan Rosenberg. I'm going to give her a call, so give me one second. Okay, so okay, good. I'm gonna give you well, thank you all. I, first of all, Go ahead. this is so cool. This is an incredibly creative way to include all of us. Thank you. Um, and I just hope that we can continue to have the board meetings like this. This is really great. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to echo Peggy Wilson's comments that there's enough going on right now that it really warrants a pause, a long pause. You have a new superintendent coming in. Uh, Mr. Matsuoka isn't stepping down until June. These contracts don't expire until June 30th. We're only in the beginning of April. Uh, I don't know anyone who isn't aware of this who doesn't echo the same sentiment that I have. 
that there appears to be a real rush to push this through, and really for no reason. You can't make an excuse about continuity or fluidity or any kind of buzzword when, in fact, we can just go ahead and let these contracts stay the way they are. And uh, when the new superintendent steps into that role, give that person to have meetings with all of us to hear our concerns, to survey and, and get, sort of get their bearings on their new job, and make a decision about how they want to build their own team with community input. And you're really um, eliminating that important process of, of community outreach, of the new superintendent getting to know all of us, our children, and our concerns. And I uh, sent an email to everyone. I'm sure you've all read it. Um, I really don't need to go into detail um, openly about it. But, you know, I've certainly, I don't know anyone who is in favor, especially of keeping Sean Carey in, the, in her current role for a whole constellation of reasons. And while, you know, John Be Becchio is personally very liked, I mean, he's, he's really a nice guy. In fact, I can share with you that uh, my daughter and all of her friends really miss him as a principal at Santa Barbara High. Um, so I, you know, I, I certainly want to be diplomatic and say not every person is a good fit for every role in every job, but he's very missed there. Um, not that there's an opening, but I just want to be sort of even handed and give sort of a positive feedback as well. But I think keeping, you know, 30 seconds. These, renew, renewing these contracts is going to make all of you as a board look, and it isn't just about optics. It's the fact that you will, I promise you, what faith the community has in you will really be greatly diminished, if not lost entirely, if you do this this evening. So thank you again for creating this very creative forum for all of us to participate. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. Bye-bye. Next, we have Mr. James Fechner, and it'll be just a second. Okay, boy, I have Mr. Fechner on the line. And Mr. Fechner, you have 30, um, I'm sorry, you have three minutes, and I'll give you a 30-second um, warm warning. Go ahead. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, uh, my name is James Fickner, and I'm uh, uh, a the board and any of the uh, vice uh, superintendent contracts. And, and I really want to talk about it beyond the specific job performance issues. Um, and uh, I think in terms of the kind of the risk and the um, board members are probably thinking about. And uh, when, when um, right now is actually the right vote. Um, I think that extending uh, these contracts time and uh, in this manner just stops. In fact, uh, financially, uh, the numbers around 800,000 in terms of both contracts, it uh, dramatically increases financials for the district. Um, Essentially, the longer the contract, more uh, the district. It was mentioned earlier, you know, when when we do new superintendent, um, perhaps they're going to have to restructure the administration to better accommodate uh, whatever our new normal is. And uh, so I'd ask, you know, why we would preemptively tie his or or perhaps her hands uh, with uh, long-term personnel obligations um, that can only be broken at a, at a very high cost. Um, you know, secondly, of course, during this uh, emergency, uh, the district's financial position is, uh, you know, is unclear. I think just as a general rule, locking the district into a few long-term contracts, um, you know, really puts the district at risk. Um, this issue of continuity or consistency, I think needs to be, you know, addressed kind of head on. Um, I mean, I, I think that the contention that any uh, valuable vice superintendent would leave if not given a large long-term contract, that's flawed. I mean, it actually, it actually sounds more like blackmail. Um, in times of crisis, which we are in right now, 
uh, the most valuable employees are those who remain focused on their jobs, um, not those um, involved in internal machinations necessary to secure large golden parachutes. And uh, as mentioned, 30 before, seconds. The, the optics, thank you. I think the optics are, are, are quite negative in this. I appreciate you putting on a, a Zoom meeting, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's been difficult for a lot of people to reach out. Um, you know, what I would suggest um, is until the new is selected and the uh, emergency, the COVID emergency is uh, you know, no longer shuttering our schools, you know, perhaps the board would consider migrating all vice superintendent employment contracts. Time. Thank you. Uh, to a month to month agreement. Thank you for your consideration and time. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, Ms. Um, Caps, we have Margaret Hamill and be just one second. Great, right, and I'm just going to make a, a housekeeping announcement. Some of our speakers are speaking to both items, so we're just going to combine both agenda items in terms of the uh, public speaking portion so we can take hear them all at once since uh, the majority of our speakers are, are speaking about them collectively. Thank you. Before we have Mr. Greg Hamill. Um, go ahead. Uh, good evening, board members. Um, before I start, I wanted to say I'm sorry to hear about Laura's ankle. I hope she makes a speedy recovery. And thank you for attending I know, after surgery. So um, I just want to let you know I'm a parent of two children at Dos Pueblos. I'm writing to express my strong opposition to the proposal to provide two-year extensions to the employment contracts of Sean Carey and John Becchio. I have several reasons for believing that Ms. Carey and Mr. Becchio should not be retained at all, much less for additional two terms, but, but that can await for another day. The only matter to decide now is whether their contracts should be extended. If the contracts are not extended, Ms. Carey and Mr. Becchio can continue to work at will at the school. There is no need to extend their contracts now as it is unlikely that either would give up their salary and job position now just because they don't have a contract. On the other hand, if the contracts were to be extended, this would lock the district into an expensive financial obligation at a time when the expenditures are already over budget. There would be no justification for doing this. In my opinion, it would be dereliction of the board's duty of oversight to do this. I presume these contract extensions are being proposed by the outgoing superintendent who would bear no adverse consequences from having these administrators locked into place for two years after his departure. By contrast, it would be a slap in the face to the incoming superintendent who would be saddled with assistance he or she may not want and may not even need. For these reasons, um, it is requested that you vote not to extend contracts at this moment in time. Thank you, and I don't need the rest of my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, bye. Bye. For the next we have Moni DeWitt, one moment. For we have Moni DeWitt, go ahead, Moni. Uh, yes, hey, board, I and everyone here, I totally wanna thank you for making it possible for us to talk at this time. And um, I just have a couple things to say because I was frankly traumatized by an experience um, with, I hate to say it, Superintendent Sean Carey. And I don't want to lay it out to the public fully because I think she isn't able to speak now and I want to be empathetic. But I can only tell you that I am a deep advocate for the people in our community whose needs have not been met for decades. And we're talking about those with learning differences and in particular those in deep poverty. And we know the LCAP is integrated, attached to this. And I see the LCAP monies going all over the place. So when I take the time, 
not to go to a client, but to attend an LCAP meeting, and I get thrown out aggressively by Ms. Carey, was sitting down, I came in quietly, other people came in, I was respectful, I was there to learn, to listen, to understand. She physically placed her body in my face. She insisted I leave. I told her this is not a good time, I'll talk to you later. She used her body repeatedly. Um, I can say no more than this was a traumatizing experience. Leadership needs to be empathetic, encouraging, engaging. My child isn't in your district because you offer no one-on-one. -on -one. I had to scrape money together to get him to private school. I'm attending your LCAP meetings out of passion as a community member out of deep concern that so many people are lost, like my son and like I was on the East Coast. 30 seconds. For my parents. Okay, I'm done. This Miss Terry is not a leader who demonstrates empathy, encouragement, or values community engagement. She demonstrates a lack of civility and beyond that, I will respect both of our privacies, but you should not continue. She is an at-will employee. And if anyone on the board wants to loan time, your time, thank you. You may call me. Thank you. Thank you. Before we have two more speakers, the next one is Lisa Sloan. One moment. Lisa is not available, so I'm going to go ahead and go to Gregory Gamlet. Thank you. I just, I'm going to just step in here as we can. And I've said this before, you know, this is a opportunity that we're, we've gone to lengths here and I appreciate the comments uh, that have been uh, in admiration of the process. We just do, you know, we, we are giving this time for the public to weigh in on, on these contracts, but the, the more personal that these comments get, it, it um, is not constructive. So just wanted to give that my perspective and my opinion um, as president of this board for those speakers remaining. Okay, we have Mr. Gregory. Go ahead. Hello, uh, members of the board. This is Gregory Gandrud. Um, I would like to see the contracts for Sean Carey and John Becchio not renewed or extended at this time. You know, we have a new superintendent who's going to be taking over soon. And in order to maximize the effectiveness of that new superintendent, the new superintendent needs to have complete control over uh, their deputies. So it would be more appropriate to uh, put this off to a later time once the new superintendent has a chance to get in and, and uh, sort of see how things are going with the staff. Another reason uh, is I really believe that uh, Becchio and Kerry have both performed in a way that's really inimical to the safety and the educational excellence of our students. And the final reason, uh, if you don't agree with my first two reasons, is that I think during this time of COVID pandemic, this is really not a good time to be making a decision like this. It's difficult for the public to participate. So until um, the pandemic has subsided and things have gone back to normal in the spirit of uh, our public participation laws, open meeting laws, uh, this matter should be continued to another time. Thank you very much for your consideration. I appreciate your time. Good night. Thank you. That concludes public comment. I just wanted to double check that we've gone through uh, the public comment as well for items F5. It looks as though we have. Yes, we have. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, for managing that so successfully. I appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. So now we will turn it over and take them item by item as as is required to take action but uh, and so i will turn it over to mr matsuoka yes thank you board for a chance to uh, address these two contracts let me make five comments <clears throat> uh, first there were comments about you know the next superintendent and the team that i pass on to that next leader so here's my perspective about inheriting a team. So when I stepped into this district, I inherited the team that Dave Cash had built. And 
I work with each person. I welcome them. Actually, they welcome me. So the idea that a new leader is going to come in and clean house and bring in their own team, I think is antithetical to the leadership and continuity of an organization. Um, I appreciated the team that uh, Dr. Cash left for us. And I'm proud of the team that I'm leaving for my successor. So I, I disagree with this idea that you leave leadership decisions for the next leader. Uh, that is not a good way to lead a school district. So board, let me clarify the nature of contracts under ed code for assistant superintendents. And so there were comments about, well, just don't renew these contracts or make them at will employees. So it is required by ed code that we have assistant superintendents uh, serve under their own individual contract. We're not allowed as a school district to let them be at will employees, to be year to year. We can't do that. Um, so we have to have contracts in place for assistant superintendents that is explicitly stated in ed code. And these contracts for these two employees, they sunset on June 30th. So the idea to let them just stop, they, they, they would cease as employees on July 1. And that just, we can't let that happen. So just wanted to clarify for you that under ed code, we have to have assistant superintendents under a contract uh, like the one presented. So my comments now talk about leadership. So these are unprecedented times and unprecedented times require very, very strong leadership. Um, I can attest and you board have already commented. Uh, these two cabinet members are working nonstop all of our cabinet members, actually all of our employees, but these two especially are solving problems every day, problems that we never dreamed that we would have to face. And so these times require extraordinary leadership and these two are meeting that challenge. You know, I'll comment about both of them, the things that I have looked forward, forward in leaders, especially cabinet members, assistant superintendents. I want people who taught in the classroom and both of these individuals have. Um, I really think that assistant superintendents needed to have been principals. And both of these individuals were principals of our high schools, VP, Santa Barbara. John Becchio was principal of Santa Barbara Junior High. So they just bring a wealth of experience of running schools. And these two are longstanding members in our community, both among our staff, but among our parents. They have the deepest respect of our parent community, and uh, I can't speak more highly of them. So renewing their contracts is the right leadership decision for our district. Uh, at this time, COVID or not, um, even under normal setting circumstances, this is the right decision for us to present to you. So that concludes my comments. I'll be glad to answer any questions as you work through both items. Thank you, Mr. Matsoka. I appreciate that. Uh, turn it over to my the board for any comments or questions. Oh, Ms. Sims Moten. Hi, hi. Thank you, uh, President Caps. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matsuoka, for those comments and even the comments that came through on public comment. Um, and I just want to say to both Sean and John, I'm sorry you have to be subject of those personal attacks. It's one thing to just have a broad, you know, comment about things or dis or express a dissatisfaction um, in that way. But I just, you know, um, just want to sit, put that out front as a board member. Um, I'm sorry that you have to to go through that. Secondly, um, as, I, as I thought about that, you know, I think it's time for our voice, our board voice to be heard. We've heard uh, from the public as we, you know, Ms. Cap stated in terms of making sure that this was an inclusive process so the public felt that they were able to uh, participate. But when I look at this, there are things to consider. Consider where the comments are coming from, the motive for which they are coming, um, and, and considering that source. And so now I want to just consider when I'm looking at this in terms of, I want to look at the whole body of the work of the two individuals that are before us. Um, and so that helps me know solidly, uh, not only experiencing their work, their commitment, seeing it every day, 
their transparency and their hard work. They show up every day <laughs> and commit it to everything that needs to happen to ensure that our students um, have a well-rounded education. And even in the midst of this particular emergency, but if you look back two years ago, we were in the midst of a debris flow and a tremendous fire, all those things that leadership stood and because it was stood and because it was steady, we still continue to be here. We still we can continue to make sure that our students have a good education. And as I said before, the school districts are the anchor uh, in our community. And I would say again, that our staff and our cabinet and our teachers, our students that show up every day, they are the anchor of the education. They are the future of this education. And so I know there are a few people uh, that may not agree with what happens. Well, that makes sense that if everybody said yes, I'd wonder who was, you know, what was going on with that, because we all need room to grow and perspectives to make us, you know, think a little bit differently. But I, I, I'm just ready to speak as a board member. I, I've just really just had my feel of some of the public comments that have been put us under duress for two and a half hours of meeting and that end up being disrespectful and threatening, uh, you know. Um, we are we are representing this community. We're representing the whole community. Um, and so I think it's important as we make this statement tonight, I, I am ready. <laughs> I know I don't need to make a motion right now, but I am ready to make that motion to move forward uh, because it's important to for us to show um, support as a board in terms of these hardworking administrators that have to work in the middle of this, even because you're looking at it from one perspective and you only get to see one perspective. Our administrators, our teachers, everybody that's showing up have a whole picture that the public doesn't always get to see. So therefore, our, 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 our decisions sometimes that we have to make, we have a full picture that we have to deal with. And I know and I trust that if there was something so egregious that either one of these folks would have done, Mr. Matsuyoka wouldn't be bringing this as a, as a recommendation. So I trust that leadership as well. And having been a staff where I had to inherit or someone inherited me, it's important that you have some sense of steadiness and continuity when you come in. Because when you come in as new, doesn't matter how well seasoned you are, you're coming into a new environment and you need some kind of continuity to kind of help you through that to solidify where you're going, where you're trying to learn. And your learning curve is, is huge in terms of the environment and, and the schools and everything that you have to deal with. So. Uh, that's that's my opinion with this and and as it being a leader it's important as a board member to support our cabinet to support our teachers to support our superintendent who, until he's no longer here and that says to the future superintendent that that they're gonna we're gonna support you uh, in, in terms of what you have to do and our expectations are there too and I know uh, having worked with both Sean and um, John on many occasions as principals and now as assistant superintendents we have expectations from this board so we don't just really nearly think that they just come and do the job and we're just going to say hey approve it there are expectations and we do have conversations and I know that the public doesn't always see that um, and so we always just get to hear that voice. Um, and this voice lately has been very disrespectful and threatening. And I quite frankly, just, just, just had enough of that. Uh, it's one thing to come and, and share your comments and, and be things. Cause when you start to do the personal attacks, I'm going to tell you, I'm not listening, but if you're coming with an open mind and being willing to share concerns that you have, then that's good. Then we're going to be working together. And that's an open dialogue and respect goes two ways. And I think we've kind of lost some of that with regards to that. I'm not trying to preach. I'm not trying to dis, you know, to, um, to dismiss the comments from the public, but I'm just, I'm just trying to say, if we're going to work together, then that means both ways, you know, respect has to come both ways. So that's my comments there. And I want to say, lastly, I appreciate the work that these two, uh, because they're two before us today, but I appreciate all the work that our cat has put in, the days that they put in. And I, I gotta tell you, probably some tears that they shed it too, that we just don't even know about. So they come to work every day, they show up and ready to do it, despite whatever is facing them that day, they're ready to go because they know in the end, it is all about our students and making sure that they have the best experience that they come, that we can keep them safe and we can keep them inspired. So keep them inspired. So I, those are my comments. And I know I don't have to make a motion, but I'm ready to make a motion that we move them forward. Oops, I'm sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Ms. Simpson, Dr. Reed. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Sims-Moten. And um, I, support, I support what you have stated. And thank you, Mr. Matsuoka, for clarifying um, uh, and defining uh, the roles uh, of both um, Sean Carey and, and Dr. Becchio. I want to speak to each of them, but so I, I feel that this is the first motion is really about Sean Carey. Um, and what I, I, I do want, I want to thank everyone for your emails. I think what's really important is that as board members, we, we read the emails, we receive them, we read them, we, and we definitely absorb them and think about them. Uh, I also appreciate those who made comments tonight. Uh, and I respect everyone's opinion and everybody has a right to be heard. Um, and, and in saying that, I'm also uh, feeling that uh, as a board member, I have a right to be heard as well. And in my comments, I feel very strongly in saying that I support um, the Second Amendment to Employment Agreement for Assistant Superintendent Sean Carey uh, for a multitude of reasons. I've had the opportunity to work closely with Sean over her tenure in this position. I am constantly amazed by her intelligence and expertise in the area of secondary education. She leads with empathy and high expectations, seeking to support all students in the process. I worked with Sean closely um, navigating and as she navigated the ethnic studies high school requirement. She worked around the clock as she still does. Uh, and she worked to be inclusive, to ensure the voices of our community, of ethnic studies now, of educators, of administrators, of students. And she made sure they were heard and acknowledged. She is process driven. And this was a huge undertaking. She took it on herself, but then she also formed a collaborative framework. And she gained respect from her colleagues, from her peers. Um, so I look at her as a lead change agent and somebody who ensured that not only this requirement took place, but multitudes of other work that she has done. So I'm with the feeling is why would we want to take somebody out of the role that they've been so successful in? Why would we want to replace someone who has consistently been successful in the work that she's doing? It, it just, it's, it's illogical. So, um, and I would like to just end with saying that public comment's important. What we hear from the community is vital and that we do want to know what you're thinking and feeling. But we are human beings and we need to be respectful of those whom we work with and who are working for us and doing the work that we need for our students. And I believe respect is first and foremost, and I go to support what Ms. Swims Moten stated, is that our public comments need to really be framed within the air arena of respect and dignity. And we can call attention to challenges that, me, that we disagree with, but we need to really go back to really looking at how we say what we say, because it does have impacts on us and it impacts all of us. So in my opinion, I see no reason but to move forward and support this recommendation for her to uh, have this, uh, her contract renewed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Just checking to see, yes, Ms. Ford. Uh, thank you. I just wanna, I'll keep my comments um, short, but I also just wanna sort of take a 30,000 foot view. Uh, first of all, as some may know who are um, calling in or watching this, uh, meeting we this these two items actually were on consent agenda and we asked for them to be put on the action item because we felt that they were important enough interesting enough and significant enough to be part of action items 
So I'm sad that there are still some people, and yes, we do read all the letters that we received. We're sad to think that there are some people who believe that we were trying to sneak this in tonight. We're not trying to sneak this in. Um, as you know, I've been a superintendent, and I, I have to agree with a lot of the comments that have been made. New superintendents appreciate and expect to inherit a talented cabinet. And uh, I think that this is the time for these two individuals to actually just be a part of a very strong leadership team to continue to provide continuity and to uh, po give positive build on the positive momentum that we're seeing in the district now, um, working side by side with the new superintendent. And that's why I'll vote yes on both of these items. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. And I'd like to speak also briefly to the process that we did uh, move this from the last meeting. I know these are challenging times, but this was on the consent agenda last time. And so this notion that we were trying to sort of shuffle this through is absolutely not true. And I appreciate that so many people have reached out and have provided us with emails and have provided us with comment and to the two people whose contracts are being uh, discussed here that, you know, we are doing this in public. This is, we, everyone is a human and this is a sensitive, personnel issues are sensitive. And that is when the, the role of the board is to take the evaluation from the and the recommendation from the superintendent on on major positions like this one the continuity is important the but we do as a board recognize that our role is to be a voice for the community and to allow this kind of conversation as as sensitive as it is to happen and that's what we've done so i just wanted to explain the timing also just one logistical point. This is the time in which hiring decisions are made. So this, even though the contracts are, uh, don't expire until June 30th, it would be absolutely inappropriate to wait until the very end for all parties involved. And so there, there was nothing rushed about this. In fact, it was delayed in order for us to do this and for, or for this new reality for us to be living under, to get our systems underway. And I'm pleased by how well that they've gone. Thus far, I'm pleased by the continuity that will continue to exist. Shall we move forward with these with these contracts? It's it's of the utmost importance now. If you look at the positions that we have and the talented people that we have in them currently, and the work and the creativity and the challenges that are before us, unprecedented challenges. So I also am in support of moving forward and just wanted to speak and acknowledge the public and thank them for speaking out, that's the role here. That's what we get to do at these in, in a de democratic system like we do have here with our school board. Um, but we also need to move forward with continuity and I'm also in support. So with that, I will ask for a motion. I will do it side by side, but I don't believe we need to have comments on both. Uh, we can, let's just take up item F4 and we'll see what the board feels about um, further comments on F5. So I need a motion. I'm happy to make it myself. That would be uh, a motion to approve the second amendment to employment agreement for assistant superintendent of secondary education, Sean Carey. Second. Who seconded that? I'm just sorry. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, item F, approval of first amendment to employment agreement of Dr. John Becchio. Do we need more further discussion board or can we move forward? Well, <laughs> Dr. Reed. Yeah, I just, I didn't get a chance to say my two cents about Dr. Pecchio. <laughs> uh, so I just would like to say that I think um, I, I fully support, you know, the work that he's done. He was uh, left the principal position that he did so successfully. And during his tenure, um, he, he made great changes in the high school, but then upon arrival here in the district, historically, we didn't have someone in place. We were struggling and he succeeded in setting up new systems and processes and, and um, really looking at hiring uh, in a different um, manner. And I believe um, our district has faced, yes, challenges with regards to our personnel and both warranted and, and not warranted. Uh, but we believe the decisions that were made relational to any of these issues were done with fidelity 
and integrity and within the legal framework required. So these qualities I hold with high esteem and I see it as important for anyone leading our human resources department. So I highly recommend Dr. Becchio uh, in this position and being uh, supportive for First Amendment. To so I'm gonna make the motion to support um, the First Amendment to Employment Agreement of Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources of Dr. John Becchio. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. So now we uh, could take a little break if anyone needs to, uh, because we're moving from action agenda to report discussion agenda. Um, anyone need to take, take a five minute break? Okay, we'll do it. We'll be back at 8.13 promptly. Thanks everyone. Welcome back. We'll go to the report agenda, discussion agenda, which is uh, G1, the presentation of the post-retirement actual, actuarial valuation. That would be, sorry, my agenda just failed me here. Mr. Tay. Thank you, board members. So tonight we have Brown. He is with Ann, um, and he, Ann is the um, company that we hired to do an actuarial study every two years. So the report that Brad is going to present tonight is for June 30th, 2019. That's as of. We've done it. Um, Brad's done this, uh, actuarial since I've been there, which is over 12 years. So he will be um, sharing with you some more good news. Last time we met, it was good news, and now it's even better news. So I'll let Brad see. There he is. Hi, Brad. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm doing Who's well, ready? thank you. Just in time, because I, I thought I was on and I wasn't. Uh, so as Megan mentioned, we're, we are presenting tonight in order to to uh, kind of summarize the results of our actuarial valuation for retiree health benefits. Um, quickly, we'll, we'll do a review of the benefits and talk about the, account, the accounting standard under which we're performing the valuation. Um, we'll go over the results of the valuation and, and, a, and a comparison to the, to the last round uh, when we presented about two years ago. So I'll give you a quick summary of results and, and changes from the prior evaluation. So as, as Meg mentioned, um, it's, it's good news here. Um, <clears throat> the, the benefits specifically, um, and if you guys can mention, just let me know when, you're, when you've got that up. Uh, the benefits we're talking about are the same. Um, really wasn't gonna focus too much on the details of the, Benefits have continued, no real changes. Um, the one kind of clarification that we incorporate in the valuation had to do with management and confidential. Um, and, and just a clarification that um, at kind of at the break point when this group was determined was back in 2010 and, and you couldn't uh, get hired into this group um, as they have different eligibility benefits. Uh, benefits, uh, they're, they're eligible for different benefits. <laughs> um, so, so the background on the accounting, it's under GASB 75. You're going to get more words here because, because you're not seeing anything on the screen, so I apologize. Um, GASB 75 is the uh, accounting guidance under which we operate. Uh, all school districts and, and governmental agencies um, follow these accounting standards um, for the, the district specifically, these rules were effective um, back in 2018 for the first time. There was a change from, there we go. Um, now let me. So Todd, that's your screen? Yeah, actually, so let's um, go down to the next one. There we go. 
the main uh, takeaway here, uh, a lot of this um, is, is similar to what we've been under. The, the main takeaway here on this slide is that we'll perform evaluation every other year um, as required. Um, what's sort of new in GASB 75 is in the off year, interim year, we do an update. So the last valuation was 2017. We performed an update in 18. Um, we did a full valuation in, in 2019, and we'll have an update again in 2020. Um, next slide. Uh, so a few more details here, but the, the, the primary item here is to understand that the impact under GASB 75 is a recognition of the entire actuarial liability, funded actuarial liability on the district's balance sheet. This was a change from the prior accounting, but, but that's um, how we operate now. Um, uh, the rest of those are, are sort of details or characteristics um, in, in the accounting and, and how we uh, um, recognize liability um, through um, the financial statements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Feel free to stop me if, uh, if, if you have any questions. Hopefully I'll see you raise your hand. Um, what are we doing in, in evaluation? It's, um, it's, it's a projection of all our uh, future benefits and, and a discount liability. Um, the items you see on this slide, probabilities of, of when people retire, how long they live, how long they're in employment, those all factor into our, um, to our analysis. Um, and, and then uh, probably the, the key, two key drivers here, uh, assumptions are healthcare trend, how fast our rates go up, um, our, our healthcare costs go up, uh, and then secondly, how long do people live um, and that's, those are on the, on the benefits. Um, it was on a previous slide, but we mentioned uh, primarily, for, primarily for management and confidential where, where there are lifetime benefits. Um, certificate and classified have fixed dollar benefit amounts. Um, and so those two factors don't come into play quite as much there. <clears throat> uh, the next slide uh, is just an illustration of our liabilities um, they, and, and how much of them, how much of those liabilities have been accrued to date and so are attributable to past service. So what this means is most of those benefits have been earned. That's represented, uh, that's in the $7.9 million. And, and the total benefits for all, um, the total liability for all benefits expected to be paid, to be paid is only slightly more at $8.1 million. Um, okay, next slide. So these are the key results for the current valuation. Uh, and the measurement date is July 1, 2019. That's our, our valuation date also. But what we're, <clears throat> what we're doing here is using that valuation and applying it for the fiscal year ending 2020. So um, the, the key items here, $7.9 million accrued liability offset, uh, reduced by assets of roughly $2.8 million, gives us a balance sheet of liability of $5.1 million, um, expense accrual of $128,000, um, and then um, the main item there at the bottom is, is the, the, the funding levels um, in recent years. So in uh, in this current year, actually, it was a $2 million pre-funding amount made in August of 2019, plus the uh, ongoing pay-as-you-go of about 400000 I think we got a typo there, 2.1. So um, I think that is supposed to be 2.1 It is, hold on. Uh, let me get back to that. Those two numbers don't add. I, I, I'm not sure if it's the, I believe it's the 2.1 in total. Um, so next slide. 
is is really uh, a comparison to where we were um, and the, on our last valuation. Um, the discount rate is just what we use to discount those future cash flows. Um, you can see big difference market assets. Uh, and there was no pre-funding back in 2017, and now we have a total of $2.8 million uh, in assets. So you compare that to the actuarial liability, uh, $10.9 million before, the $7.9 now, um, and, and an unfunded liability that, that, is, that has shrunk down to five, uh, approximately $5 million. So, you know, great news here. Um, clearly, the district has taken positive action to reduce the unfunded liability um, since 2015. And, and really, it goes back further. Um, but since 2015, that unfunded liability went from 17 million down to five. Um, that's a byproduct of, of district actions taken to manage these liabilities, um, modifying benefit eligibility, um, looking at the rates that, that retirees are paying and, and, and basing them off um, uh, retiree only rates. Um, so the premiums they pay, and then ultimately the big one there is, is taking an active approach uh, to pre-funding uh, and, and putting money aside. Uh, so all those go into uh, bringing this liability, as I mentioned at the bottom, since 2015, the unfunded liability from $17 million to $5 million. Um, that's that's really the gist of it. Um, any, any questions? Any questions or comments? Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Thank you very to... much. Again, apologies. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Yeah, Miss Sims. Yeah, okay, Brad. Um, so that's a huge um, drop, which is encouraging from the seventeen million to the five. And I know you said it's resulting from district actions. Can you speak a little bit more to what those are specifically to what those actions are? or that, that were, that took place? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the first one that it really isn't even captured here is, is the, the benefits that are provided and, and the level of benefits and how long do they go for. Um, the, the most recent action with management and confidential was uh, sort of closing that group and freezing uh, the benefits so that a future um, hires into those groups, they don't get the same level of benefits because it's pretty costly to provide lifetime health care. So I, I'd say that's that's the, the first thing that occurred from a from a time standpoint. Um, the, the the most recent and, and, and the next bigger biggest item is um, district pre-funding, and so it's putting putting the the few million dollars aside and and being serious taking basically this liability serious um, and, and pre-funding for it. Now that has effect not just on um, having assets in the plan, but it also affects um, the discount rate that we use to determine the liabilities. And so you think you can think of it as if you put money aside, you'll have uh, funds there that, that, can earn a return that will pay for the benefits as opposed to just putting out more cash later. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It does. And will we ever be fully funded? Excuse me? Will we ever be fully funded? <laughs> um, it, it, it's a great question, right? And, and uh, I'll, I'll turn to staff in, in a second, um, but, but let me comment on this um, also. If, if you think of compare, if, if you ask, oh, when are we going to be 100% funded? Retiree health care is a little bit different because there's so many variabilities. And, and I might not even suggest that you go to 100% funded. So if you just look at, um, uh, I know it's not up now, but the, the, the liability went from 10.9 million to 7.9. So there's a lot of fluctuation there, right? And I mean, we do this valuation based on lots of assumptions. And, and our numbers 
are only as good as our assumptions as, as they hold out. So um, if you put too much money in, the district can't get it all back, right? It, it has to go towards um, funding for the benefits. Um, yeah. You know, is where, where you're at now, you know, maybe a third liability, is that the right amount? You know, maybe not, I, I would continue to go, but where, where you might want a pension plan, uh, your pension plan to be 90, funded or so or a hundred you know for retiree medical I'd, I'd probably drop that down a notch in terms of target funding yes so let me add a comment here and I think Brad I asked you this question the last time you presented <clears throat> um, uh, I've always worked with a target goal of about 85 percent being funded in the irrevocable trust um, you don't want to get to a hundred percent because you can't take the money back out um, Meg, I'm, I'm going from memory a little bit. I think with the additional funds in this year, is our count up to about 4.8 million, I think? Well, before the pandemic, it was about at 5.1 million. We were doing really well on the interest and the contributions, but I have not gotten um, a report yet as of March. With the with the stock market going down as it has, but you know even so, if we had about 4.8, which was a couple of months ago, um, you know, and our liability is seven million, that's still really good. Getting there, I think the last time I did the percentage, it was like 65 percent. So, you know, to get to 85 would be a great goal. But what really is that we don't have to put a high percentage on our payroll tax, which relieves all the funds that payroll comes out of. So it percentage of the um, expense of the payroll expense. So if we go from 1%, which we have been doing to a half a percent, um, is, is, is beneficial to the general fund as well. So the um, par, the irrevocable trust, with which put our money, um, is earning good interest. And um, Brad and I talk about the the return on that PARS account, and also meet U.S. Bank really to talk to them about where we're going to money if we're going to keep the money in the same place. So it all fits in together. There's a lot of um, entities in this involved in this and trying to get us the best return on our money. Um, when I met with U.S. Bank, they uh, said that we are in really good shape, that most districts not funded their um, um, actuarial or their OPEB. So we're in of course, we don't have a liability like some districts have, so we, we should count our blessings on that regard. Yeah, so I'll just respond, Carrie, to your, um, hopefully I give the same answer that I gave the last time <laughs> you, you asked, but I, I think that target is, is a, a appropriate, um, you know, whether it should be 85 or 80 or 90, I don't know, but uh, as I mentioned, I think 100% on a retiree medical liability, I wouldn't advise that. Um, and so something a little bit lower um, is being, I think, fiscally prudent in, 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 a, in, a, in, uh, in setting that as a goal. Um, and, and then the closer you get, um, the more closely you should also look at, all right, now do we start um, not reeling it back, but just kind of stay at that level. You know, whether it's at 80 or 85 or 90, that, that's probably not such a big deal. But getting to that point and watch, and leaving it at that area and managing to that at that point is probably a, a good idea and, and response. But Brad, don't we have to put in what you tell us to do as pay as you go? That is required. Yeah, so at some point, right, <laughs> what pay as you go does is it's taking funds from the district budget, right, mm -hmm. to, to pay that. So at, at the point you get uh, a, a higher, or you're at a higher funded ratio, at some point you can even start 
pulling those funds from the trust. I mean, if you think about it, ultimately that's what you're trying to do by setting the money, the funds aside anyway, is to pay for future uh, retiree healthcare costs. So once you get your funding up to some level and, and maybe it's 85%, then at that time, I think we would start saying, okay, let's, Let's take advantage of what you've done in the past and draw from those funds. Okay. Does that make sense, Meg? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So I think we're not quite there yet. You're in good shape and heading there. And to echo the sentiment compared to many other school districts, pretty in pretty good shape, I think, or at least on the way there. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, Brad, thank you so much. Thanks again. And again, hey. apologies for the... We're doing pretty well here. Okay. Uh, moving forward. Uh, thank you on uh, item G2. That would be Ms. Carey. Uh, good evening again, board. Thank you for um, this second secondary education topic. I want to just appreciate that the first one we wanted the quick action on because it helps us order materials for the for the fall. Um, this is a, a request for your approval, which will come back then um, next board meeting for action uh, that you that you approve two new secondary course requests. Um, one is stagecraft, and it's coming to us from the junior high space, which is exciting to see a proliferation of of, a, of, a, of theater arts in the junior high space. And of course, even though it's not a CTE course, it can be a, a pathway to a CTE course. And of course, I'll take your any questions you have about that. Um, like Laura, I have many screens running. <laughs> Um, and the second one is an IB course. It falls in the visual arts domain. Um, and as actually similar to the comment I made earlier about IB textbooks, um, when we have a prolif proliferation of IB course offerings, it benefits not just those students who are pursuing the full IB diploma, uh, the full international baccalaureate diploma, but also the hundreds of students who take one, two, or three or more IB classes. And so this is a just a really rigorous um, and exciting elective offering within the IB program at Dos Pueblos High School. Um, I'm open to your any questions you might have. Any questions or comments from the board? Let me find you. I, I would like to take the class. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Thank you, okay. Ms. Ford. I'll, I'll bring it back um, in action next time. I'll also just slip in there that I did get clarification on the professional learning donation. Is it appropriate to clarify that now or later in the agenda? Uh, we can zoom back up to, uh, that's appropriate to, uh, to refer to a consent agenda item. Uh, we've already voted, so it's fine. Okay, I can alternately email the board too, if that helps. Uh, you have the floor. I, I suspected as much, but both Santa Barbara High School and San Marcos, um, the foundations there are able to donate funds that help give flexibility to the site administrators um, in paying teachers in non-traditional times after work hours during the summer um, to engage in professional learning that, of a flexible nature that supports the site's instructional focus. Um, so that's, that, that is what it is. I just didn't want to speak out of turn without confirming, especially for Ms. Ford. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Carey, thank you. We're gonna move on to uh, our important item here. They're all important, but G3, which is a COVID-19 status report. Mr. Matsuoka. I'm gonna to ask Todd. Todd, do you have that report on your computer and can you share it? I don't have it, but I can bring it up really quickly. Okay. Um, tell you what, uh, cabinet members, you've, um, if cabinet members can get to it, we'll start working through it. Um, it's organized into seven domains. <clears throat> uh, uh, 
Okay, first and uh, foremost, we're going to hear from our teaching and learning leaders. So um, in some cases, board, you will see some written comments and, and others. Um, it's such a moving target every day is like in like every day feels like, I don't know, a week right now. Um, so we'll start with uh, elementary and I'll just let uh, Dr. Ramirez share, you know, just a verbal observation of what's transpired the last couple of weeks and um, give the board a chance to ask any questions. So Dr. Ramirez. Hi, good evening board, uh, board president, uh, Ms. Caps. Um, I wanna make sure everybody can hear me. Okay. Um, yeah, as, as uh, Mr. Matsuoka had indicated, uh, things are very, have been very dynamic. Um, I think there are a lot of similarities uh, between elementary and secondary, and of course, things that are particularly unique to elementary. So I do want to highlight, um, broadly, we have spent uh, the last, um, you would say, three weeks, really, um, reorganizing ourselves for learning, in a, in a, in, for remote learning. And that has meant something a little bit different by school and even by grade span. Uh, we have capitalized on our one-to-one um, -one deployment in four through six, um, and that has been, um, by and large, a, a better transition, um, or at least a more, um, a more nimble one, more swift one. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of work on all of our, our um, site teachers and staff. Um, in third grade, uh, we, have, we were able to, uh, right before spring break, develop a plan to deploy devices that otherwise don't travel home, but that uh, we, we anticipated and we wanted to err on the side of caution uh, at that time on a pot uh, potentially longer, um, a longer uh, time of closure. And of course that was unfortunately very uh, confirmed uh, recently. So uh, where the bulk of our attention is focused as an administrative staff in particular is in trying to fulfill the needs around our lower grade, our youngest students, including preschool. Uh, so what we have done is uh, we focused our efforts on redeploying devices uh, to, our, to our youngest learners, uh, to, to really um, equipping them with uh, materials and uh, print uh, consumables. There's still a lot of work to be done in that arena. And we are uh, on a daily basis looking at those opportunities. In our uh, early childhood space, in our preschool space, we looked at, um, and our, our, um, our coordinator, uh, along, our two coordinators actually, a coordinator uh, of after school and our coordinator of preschool, Daisy uh, Estrada Ochoa and Kathy Serrano, uh, worked together to push out devices by crosswalking, um, by crosswalking uh, the list of, of students with siblings, uh, because we knew we wanted to prioritize those students that did not have a, a device. Um, and that's just to equip us with the opportunity to reach out to them. We still know that the needs around connectivity are deep, and we're trying to find workarounds, including uh, very traditional methods of, of uh, reaching out to parents, including phone calls, um, and uh, from, from all staff, from front office staff, all the way to our teachers and principals. And, and then finally, we have looked at wherever feasible opportunities to continue to use uh, traditional methods of delivery. So we were able, in order to try to bridge the gap uh, as we ramped up very quickly, uh, we used uh, mail to send out just um, some, some bridge materials to get us through. So uh, those things have all come together very, very quickly. Um, we've tried to uh, develop systems very rapidly, um, but um, you know, we're, we're continuing to assess things on a day-by-day -day basis. And uh, right now the, the, the function was just on reaching out to parents, connecting with them, and, um, and then also developing schedules uh, that work for families and all families and all students, including um, our youngest learners, our students with special needs, um, those, those have all been really site-based uh, activities. And our district office personnel has been working uh, one by one with our principals to try to um, see where there are challenges and to try to address them on a case-by-case -case basis. So with that, um, 
I turn it over to the board if um, anybody has uh, any questions or uh, further comments, um, I, I would gladly receive them. Ms. Ford. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you so much for your report. I uh, have some questions that are a little bit specific. Um, I'm wondering, I saw mostly on social media that there are efforts to get all the kids, everything that was in their cubbies or in their desks. Uh, has that happened consistently across the district? Um, we, we, I wouldn't say consistently quite yet. That's still work in progress. We've had to balance um, the ability to do that with, of course, the safety, welfare, and, and just following guidelines that have been set out for our employees. So it's been a very, um, it's been a very challenging uh, balance to strike. By and large, we have been able to release a lot of those materials, um, but that's something that we're still making our way through. Um, I know that um, specific schools, I know for a fact have, uh, but I wanna make sure that, uh, that that's been happening. And they've been happening really over the last, um, some schools gotta, gotta, gotta jump on it a little earlier than others, um, but that is something that we're still looking at even this week, is that delivery of, of materials. Um, also, I, I would mention that um, assuming that, um, well, um, assuming that, you know, things remain even as they are now, uh, we will continue to try to find ways to um, ensure that there is a follow-up to those materials because now that we know that closure is for the rest of the year, uh, we, we want to make sure that we continue to find uh, ways of getting materials to kids. So to come back to your question, um, most schools did do that and they coupled them with a uh, delivery of devices, particularly in the lower grades. Uh, but that is something that um, we, we still need to loop back on and make sure that we find ways of, of doing it. And it all has to be balanced, of course, with the safety and welfare of our employees and our families and students for that matter. I do understand that. Um, I, I have a friend who's a principal in the Bay Area and they actually mailed everything home to the students. Might be something to consider. I was wondering if there's consistency around how many hours a day for certain grade levels, how much, you know, expect what the expectation is for time on task or instruction, especially distance learning. We have, we've, uh, we've normed that. We are gonna to continue to look at guidelines. We've released guidelines for the elementary uh, similar to the way in which secondary has, and Ms. Carey will, would speak to that more, more fully for the secondary. But for elementary, we have, we've normed around our grade spans, um, and we've thought of it internally between synchronized and asynchronous learning. And so our, our asynchronous, so that's just time for students to do more independent work. Um, that, that is normed for the lower grades. And uh, we provided a, a a fairly broad range just to provide some latitude for teachers to make local decisions on that and then our upper grades as well. Uh, so, so yes, we did provide guidelines. We'll continue to revisit those just to see how they're working. And, um, but there were guidelines provided and more, more is emerging now that teachers are, are back working with their, with their colleagues um, and really redefining how they're, how they're teaching. Great. And this might be for Mr. Rickman, or maybe it's for you. Are, you uh, are teachers taking a role? Do we know how many kids are calling in? I know that LAUSD has, um, is working hard to find something like 7,000 more high school kids, for example. Um, but are we, keep, are we keeping track? Are we keeping role? This might be a question more for Fran. I can tell you, uh, we one of the things we did was we we quickly developed a check-in system where where teachers could get a hold of all their kids. A lot of sites did it before we even had the the system. But uh, I'll turn it over to Fran. My understanding is is that we we've, we've gotten in touch with a lot of students. Yeah, actually, let me let me go ahead and, and respond to that, Miss um, Care, Miss. Uh, Ms. Ford, uh, we, we are, and down to the student. So I can tell you that wherever there has been an inability, uh, wherever, now that we are um, moving in the direction of Zoom, wherever we see a student that has not accessed, we, we, we've uh, either a teacher or a front office person or a principal uh, has made contact or at least tried to make contact repeatedly with each one of our students. Uh, we are finding um, some instances where Families have moved out of the area, 
or families are experiencing some hardships that don't allow them to be as engaged as we would like even in this environment. Uh, but we are accounting for every student in that and, and making, making every effort to ensure that we're connecting with uh, families. As, as you know, because of uh, the age group that we're talking about, communicating with, um, with students oftentimes goes through the adults. So we are, um, we are actively working on that. I don't have a, a percentage to quote you right now, but I can tell you that systems have been developed and Mr. Rickman alluded to one important one. Uh, where we're trying to log uh, information uh, relative to devices in the home, uh, connectivity in the home, and uh, even even broader li living conditions. So we are actively doing that down to the last student. Great, thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. I think we can move on to the next section of the, uh, of the report with questions ongoing. As Dr. Ramirez mentioned, um, we've been working in sync, the elementary uh, principals, leaders, and the secondary ones, and our ed services team, as well as cabinet members to be as unified in our approaches as we can be. We're cognizant of the fact that families have multiple students, sometimes in an elementary and a junior high and a, and a high school. Um, we just really want consistency of messaging and consistency of protocols and process. Um, as you see linked there, there's a whole new master schedule that we're using across the secondary schools that's different from our traditional uh, bell schedules. And uh, we have an iteration for, for San Marcos that is uh, sensitive to the block schedule that they use at San Marcos High School. Um, and so that has worked well. I'm happy to report um, after our, our launch last week. Um, and really is the best way for people to understand just what a reshaping of the, t of the, of the way we do teaching and learning in these new circumstances uh, looks like for us um, and what it's taken. Um, I do want to take a, a few moments to acknowledge and then open up to some questions or feedback or input that um, all of the topics that we're managing and, and concerned about are important to families and students of, of any age. In fact, in many ways, the stakes for a grade schooler who is uh, working hard to read at grade level are arguably higher even than a, a student who's older um, and is farther along in their educational career and is feeling very disrupted uh, by all of this in terms of uh, what it might mean for college admissions and, and things of that nature. Um, what tends to get the most attention though is the the higher grade levels and so there's particular sensitivity to what happens in our high school spaces um, and particularly when it comes to grading and grad requirements and so we've heard a lot of questions and concerns about those topics uh, from the early moments and hours even of following school closure um, and we've used i think a really smart approach of working on that internally and having uh, conversations that are thoughtful and analytical about that, even as we, in some cases, await, and in other cases, um, uh, to take a cue from guidance that might be coming to us from Sacramento, um, whether that be the California Department of Education, uh, California State Board of Education, um, but also the post-secondary institutions who acting as a consortium have been issuing uh, guidance as well. And so more specifically than what you see in the, written in the report there, we know that the UCs and CSUs are accepting of, of pass fail or credit no credit uh, grades. And that has caused uh, a ripple effect in K-12 in institutions in terms of trying to determine local policies um, that will articulate with that, that guidance, uh, that, that announcement from the UC CSU system. Um, and I can, signal to, to you as a board and to the community that credit, no credit will be a, a, a part of how we do business moving forward when it comes to assessing learning. Um, what we do not have total clarity on still is um, if that will be the, the blanket uh, way of doing business or if there will be some other um, permutations of how assessing student learning can work. And then, of course, we will need to sort through the implications and applications of any policy decisions we, we make. Um, we have uh, the, some preliminary recommendations um, that I want to 
be open about now. One is about uh, pending community service hours that are required for graduating seniors and our inclination to waive those pending hours uh, for community service, um, which is a grad requirement. Um, and then we've also had some uh, some pretty robust uh, planning conversations about credit recovery, uh, particularly for graduating seniors or seniors scheduled to graduate for whom credit recovery is a must. Um, so each one of these topics that I'm naming specifically means different things to different people. Um, the grades conversation means a lot actually to our juniors and sophomores, even more than a lot of our second semester seniors where uh, community service hours or credit recovery might be the topic of most acute concern. Um, what I will leave you with after having mentioned some of these specific topics is just this notion that we're working very hard to strike the right balance of um, swift but thoughtful decision making with an appropriate amount of process. So we don't want to make decisions unilaterally. We are tracking that uh, system wide guidance, as I indicated earlier, and we're actually particularly attuned to and researching our neighboring districts and counties. Um, we feel that what we decide here locally um, will really matter and, and need to be to some degree in keeping what's happening in our region. And most of the guidance we've seen is, is system-wide or is from post-secondary institutions. And there are some unique considerations for us to attend to in a, in a K-12 space. Um, that would be my, my written and verbal report. And I am certainly open to questions or, or input. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Reed, sorry, thanks. Yeah, I just was wondering, um, and I it, just around, like, for example, a program like PEAK, are, are programs like that, have they been stopped or are they supporting? I mean, are, is there mentorship going on and supporting students um, during this time? Just to how, how is that working? That's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. Um, it's a really timely one. This is probably an opportunity to highlight the fact that as a cabinet team and as leadership teams at, at school sites as well, um, we pretty quickly saw the need to organize our work and our decision making into phases, where the first phase was just about making sense of the world of school closure, and the second phase was launching our, our distance or learning and remote learning. And now we are entering into what we call phase three, where we're starting to take up these layers um, of, of things like peak uh, mentoring and tutoring. So uh, we've actually just, just been talking about that very thoughtfully today. And really what I want to represent is we have a whole continuum of service providers that provide additional supports to our students. Some of those services happen on our school campuses. Some of them happen with our employees. Some of them happen with our employees, but not on our school campuses. Some of them happen um, on our school campuses, but not with our employees. <laughs> and so those, those different, I'm going to use the word permutations again, but those different permutations become really important um, in the world where we're using virtual platforms, where we have to consider student privacy, um, where we have service providers who may or may not be our employees. Um, so what we're doing is systematically working our way along that continuum and providing um, guidance that ranges anywhere from um, we just don't think that at this time we're going to be able to engage with you from here till, till uh, June 3rd because the nature of your partnership with us does, does, not allow, does not allow for that in a safe or appropriate or legal manner. Two, uh, to come directly to answering your question, in the case of PEAK, which really is, is our program, even though that relies on uh, community partnerships, um, it's, it's a program we own and oversee. We are... Uh, deeply involved in exploring uh, ways that we can actually reactivate that tutoring and mentoring. It has not been happening formally. And when we do that, it is very clear that we will be um, adhering to all of the, the safety guidelines and protocols that are being established for classroom teachers and their students. So uh, Dr. Madrigal and the high school principals today were just having that conversation about those protocols along with, uh, with some support from Dr. Wagonick as well. Everyone's very eager to see those supports back online as soon as we can get them there and feel confident that, that we're doing it appropriately. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that explanation. Good question. Uh, other questions or comments, Ms. Carey? Okay, let's keep moving here. Um, 
So that goes to uh, special education. Would that be Dr. Ragnick? Hey, Ms. Caps. Yes. Uh, before we go to special ed, <clears throat> uh, let me add something to uh, what Sean was talking about. And we talked about this in cabinet. Uh, like the community service requirement is a good example. We anticipate that as your cabinet team, your leaders, we're going to have to temporarily suspend various things that are either part of board policy or, you know, just expectations for college admission. We're going to track all of those. If it seems like something really big, we will get that out to you, like through, you know, the daily updates that are coming out to you or every other day. We're going to highlight those, but some of these things are moving so fast that, you know, we couldn't possibly wait to the next board meeting to have the board weigh in and then formally like waive or suspend part of board policy. So I, I just wanted to run that idea by you as a board, give you a chance to give us feedback. Um, you know, this is a, a time where executive leadership does need some space, um, but we also wanted to give the board a chance to you know, give us your feedback about, you know, how much do we inform you, keep you in the loop, formally ask for approvals. What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, Dr. Reed. I would just say that um, you're in the trenches and you're, you're facing the situation at hand. So, uh, I would trust your judgment in the way you unfold it. I think what's been very helpful are the Friday letters that you provide. Um, and I think also um, the feedback that we get from the public of questions that come up, we can always raise them with you as well um, so that we have that dialogue, that open dialogue, which is important. Um, but I, it's, it is very fluid and, uh, so I would um, defer to your leadership in, in that. And um, should something come to our attention or a question that comes up, uh, it would be to have that opportunity to, you know, ask and, and see, you know, what the process is. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's hard to sort of say, I appreciate the question, but it's hard to sort of answer in theory. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, we just need to be in constant communication. I know this has been an intense time on in, in all levels and we're all paying attention. We're all responding quickly and uh, we just need to be in, in close touch so the big decisions mm -hmm. can be shared, uh, you know, as quickly as possible and with feedback if necessary and if possible. Okay. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Great. Just checking right. in. Okay, uh, Dr. Wagnick. Yes. Uh, good evening, Ms. Caps and board and my colleagues and the public who are out there. Um, so we really, um, for special education, um, it, it was an interesting process um, of, of you know, special education um, is as unique an individual as, as the individual students who have IEPs. So there were a lot of, of pieces to consider here. Um, but really for tonight, what I want to uh, fill you in our, in our um, we focused on uh, communication and then also getting really clear on staff roles and responsibilities. Um, we were, we're working from the idea that calm is contagious and um, our special education management team really wants to remain calm and, and set up um, conditions under which um, our teachers and all of our specialists can go about their work um, calmly and confidently um, with the idea that that's going to quell the anxiety and um, so in terms of communication, we, we by law have to send out prior written notices anytime we change the um, services for a student. So each, um, each family received a prior written notice. And then when we um, extended the closure through the end of the school year, a second prior written notice was sent out to each family member. 
uh, I want to report to the board that families have um, really been very gracious and understanding and um, and supportive of um, of teachers and specialists and administrators through this process. Um, we also, so what we set up uh, was a system for um, when teachers came back March 30th, their first goal, not just teachers, but also the service providers, the case managers, their, their um, charge was to make contact with each family that they work with. So our, uh, our case managers served 28 students maximum. So their role was to reach out to those 28 families during the first few days, check in with them, and set up a schedule for sessions and communications. Um, that was also the charge of all the, the service providers. So a student doesn't just have their teacher, their case manager, they also may have a psychologist, speech and language therapist, occupational therapist, maybe a behaviorist. So um, depending on the services that are in their IEP. So each of those individuals also reached out to the families to start setting up schedules for providing service. Um, the state of California, thankfully, was, was very clear from the get-go that um, what we really needed to do was honor the spirit of the IEP um, and, and serve the student as best we could given the distance. And so um, just as the case in general ed, um, teachers are thinking out of the box, working with families, and we're really with the families um, serving in roles that, that teachers and paraprofessionals- Well, in this case, it was to develop- Okay. Um, got a little nervous there. I thought we had one of those bomber, Zoom bombers on us, but I think we're okay. Um, anyway, w really working with the families because um, as is the case in general ed, they're providing some of these services, doing exercises with students, et cetera. So um, the communication from um, service providers and teachers to families was key. And then finally for us as, as SPED leadership was the staff communication piece um, last week, we had a voluntary Zoom huddle um, each morning at 8 a.m. The first day we broke Zoom, we, we can have up to 100 people, and we had 130 who tried to get in. So we had people who actually couldn't get in. And each day since then, it's been anywhere from, from uh, about 50 to 75 um, special ed staff members who are checking in on the huddle. We've uh, taken that down to three days a week this week. And um, it, it's actually uh, been a really helpful way to support people, for them to share what they're doing, but primarily to get real, really good clarification on, on what the expectations are for them to be able to understand um, what they um, are to be doing uh, in terms of supporting the students. And um, we, do, we did set up a document, which you uh, do have at your disposal there to review. We laid out the roles and responsibilities for uh, each um, job alike group. And there are many within special ed. Some of them are small, uh, nurses, all the way up to um, mild mon teachers, and we, we have um, about a hundred or so of those. So um, those are there. And um, we also created an FAQ um, that we keep adding to. And really, so really to bundle it all up, it's about keeping the lines of communication clear, making sure that families are, um, seeing the staff members as touch points that they're getting regular communication and um, just moving through and doing the best we can each day. So I will open it up to questions. Questions, comments? Just to... Dr. Reed. 
Just a quick comment. Um, it just sound it sounds so overwhelming, and yet <laughs> it, you've handled it so well. I, I, anyway, I it just it's it's just mind boggling what you guys have been putting together. So just acknowledging the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and Thank you. Um, I, I echo Dr. Reed's comments. I, I would just ask um, Fran, in terms of support for parents, particularly with the, our students with special needs, how, how are we supporting them maybe through other outside agencies, just giving them support and, you know, keeping them, you know, um, supported through this process where they're, you know, he taking on a, you know, an extra burden, you know, at a time when they're having to learn how to teach school and all the, and then meet the needs of our students. So how are we supporting those parents or, and or families for that matter? Um, I would say uh, general ed and special ed. Um, we have different folks serving in that capacity. Um, our, our, what's it, our family um, outreach unit through um, ed services is doing a lot of that. Um, work, but we also, with the case managers checking in regularly, they're really the ones who um, are charged with coordinating all the different service providers, knowing what's going on with the families, and and then trying to, you know, stay stay in touch. But in the secondary, we do have the school counselors, and they're carrying a lot of that right now. They're checking in on the students who are uh, missing. They were talking to me earlier this week, um, earlier this week, yesterday, can't keep <laughs> track of days, um, <laughs> about, you know, how many of our students are needing to work right now. Mm -hmm. So the issue of work permits came up, all these things. So we really are serving as, you know, social services. Um, and I would say that our um, mental health support uh, providers FSA and um, Calm ha are just doing amazing things. Um, but beyond that, re uh, referrals to the food bank and to our, our meals, all of that, I hear stories of, of people, not just our counselors, but teachers um, finding that information and sharing it. So. Okay, thank you, and and thank you for mentioning FSA and Calm because that was going to be my next question. How are they supporting it? But you've answered that, so thank you very much. And again, thank you for all the work of coordinating all of this. I, I want to say anecdotally that um, those two organizations um, have doubled and at least doubled their work, um, but they're doing little special touches like FSA sent. Um, sent a little uh, package of colored pencils and uh, mandala coloring books to all of their students who are getting one-on-one -on -one services. Mm. I mean, just these little things to help them. And FSA, because it's also social services, has really stepped up um, that family support arm of their, their organization. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, at first five, we were looking at our contracts because we have contracts with COM and or more so with FSA, and then they subcontract out. And so just, you know, having the freedom as a contractor to, to allow those agencies in this time of need to repurpose their contracts and, and to support the families in, in terms of that. And so they were reaching out to us about that. So I was just trying to make that connection. And I can see they're, how they're having to readjust their their units of service, if you will, um, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the families now versus what they were they perhaps were contracted for to do. Right, right. And they are adjusting for us as well. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, I think we can keep moving here. Thank you, board. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Technology. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to start with a thank you. I want, I want to thank our teachers for their just being so flexible uh, in this time of, of change, especially with uh, everything we're asking them to do with technology. And I also really want to take a second to just thank my staff who went from just serving, uh, you know, still a large group of people, but now we're taking phone calls from parents and it's been 
it's been an amazing time and I couldn't be more proud of the people that I work with. Um, you know, we were able to hit the ground running uh, really during this time because of the efforts we've made in the past to be sure that uh, our teaching staff have mobile devices and the majority of our students do. Um, our main concerns now really are around connectivity. Uh, we have put over 300 families in touch with Cox and they're in the process of getting uh, Cox internet at home. We have 500 Wi-Fi hotspots on order. Uh, we were able to get uh, really early in the queue on that. And so we should, those should be delivered uh, by the end of next week. Um, we've done a lot of checking in with families with the help of sites. You know, Dr. Ramirez talked to that, uh, spoke to that uh, a bit. Uh, we have been getting uh, a lot of information from families about, you know, making sure that they have a device, that their device is functioning properly. We've um, had two days where we've had a kind of a no contact swap out of uh, devices that weren't working. And, and we're going to be doing that uh, every Wednesday and Friday. So as kids have devices that break or stop working, we're going to have uh, opportunities for families to get to the district office and, and we're going to do no contact contact swap out of devices. And for families that can't get here, we're finding other ways to make sure that they have what they need to learn. Um, you know, the other thing that we've done is that, you know, a lot of times we forget about the adults in these situations. And so we've made a point, a, a specific point to reach out to all of our te teachers. I put a survey together to all of our teachers just to make sure that all of their devices are functioning properly and that they have functional Wi-Fi at home. And we, we found that we have several of our employees that don't have uh, really good Wi-Fi capabilities at home, so we're working on how we can figure that out. And then the other thing, we, we're in the middle of the board um, approved us buying uh, devices for a lot of our, our classified staff a couple of board meetings ago, so that was perfect timing because those devices are all coming in now, so we can also have our, a lot of our classified employees working from home. Um, it's just a lot. It, there is just a lot going on. Um, and we, I couldn't be prouder of how we're handling it. I, I know uh, Ms. Ford talked about she has friends in other areas and in, in, uh, other school districts. And I have friends and family uh, who are educators across the state. And, and everyone I talk to, uh, it just seems that, that, that this is not tooting our own horn, or maybe it is, is that we are well uh, out of ahead of things and and like I said it's it's a lot of it is due to the people that you know work in this organization our teachers flexibility and the amazing flexibility of our family and students um, so I, I'll leave it there and be happy to answer questions thank you D dr. Reed yes I just wanted to acknowledge you uh, mr. Rickman for your leadership in this I mean I know certainly in my experience where I work at Antioch and just moving our adjunct teachers into remote teaching experiences and just, you know, the idea of it when you first hear about it, it's just so overwhelming, like all of this. But, you know, obviously you had a plan and the strategy and as a collaborative team, as a cabinet, you have all worked together. And um, it's, 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 I'm sure a constant, um, fluid situation, but it seems to me, like you said, that we really are moving ahead and really on track for where we should be. And uh, I just want to give my appreciation to the work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Simpson. Again, uh, thank you. I echo those comments with Dr. Reed. Um, I was sitting on a funding panel uh, last week, I think it was, um, and they were talking about uh, partnerships for education that are providing computers for families. Are we coordinating with them or how we're not responsible for supporting them, but are we coordinate with them as opposed to getting devices into the homes of families who don't have them? Yeah, we, we, uh, they've reached out to us. How they've been a, a big help is uh, helping coordinate our, our work with Cox communications. Um, they've been helping with that, with uh, our, our families, uh, with a number of our families. 
we are not in a place where we really need devices. Uh, we have plenty of devices. It's about getting them in the hands of kids. You know, uh, Dr. Ramirez talked about the TK through two space. That's, that's our greatest need right now. Uh, we have iPads on order and we also have iPads that we, we've sent out for repair. I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to provide devices for those kids. Um, and it's important for us, we could, we could leverage computers for families, but so many of our teachers are used to uh, using specific apps and, and the iPad in general that I, it, I think it's important for us to, to stay with one platform so teachers and students can use what they're familiar with. One of the things that has been uh, really great is that our teachers and students didn't have to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've been doing it. Our, our kiddos know how to use devices and know how to get online and, and know how to do the work. So, um, like I said, we hit the ground running. We really did. Well, does that answer your question? It, it does. And I appreciate the fact that, you know, as they, you know, back in the day when computer families didn't have access, that was a great program. And I still think it is. I just think in terms of, you know, how do they then change or repurpose their program to fit with where the technology is going now in terms of those pieces, getting it out, out to families. So that's good feedback that you're giving me. So when I, you know, talk back to them and just say, well, how do we rethink about this support, um, you know, uh, with regards to tablets and, you know, iPads that are going on now. So what does this program need to stay relevant? Yeah. And, you know, I'll add because Maria, Laura, this is the wonderful thing about uh, technology. Maria Laria Scorton is actually watching and she texted me and uh, we, she points out that we really should leverage computers for families uh, uh, in order to get computers in the homes of a lot of our families who where an iPad is not enough. So I, I will be sure to work on that more. Yeah, as I last checked, they ha they had distributed about a, about seventy, and they had a hundred available, and they may be getting more, particularly in this time where everybody's going to remote learning. So there's a lot of back order on things that you know devices. So at least they would have something to at least be a part of that. So they do still have some available um, for you know to even talk, reach out to them. Yes. Thanks. Um, Todd, I just had a couple questions. Oh, Kate, you can go, for, uh, Ms. Ford, you can go for, before me. Well, thanks, I'll just be quick. Um, just with a quick comment based on all of this and then sort of the, the frosting that you provided, Mr. Rickman, I, I know that you're kind of in crisis mode and there's a lot of loose ends and things that have to be addressed and fixed, but I am absolutely excited and I know education will never be the same after this time. And that is, um, that's a wonderful thing. So thank you. Yeah, you know, you, you bring up a great point. We've talked about a lot in cabinet about how this is a horrible crisis, but in education, it's really gonna move us forward in a direction that we, we, we needed to go. And, and this is gonna jumpstart that. I like that, I like the optimism. I just wondered on the Cox thing, Todd, um, if there's more can be done, because I've just heard anecdotally, you know, challenges, you said 300 people have, have been able to participate in their free program, but is it free just for a month or free for two months or something like that? Or what's the, what's the details? So I'm going to, I'm going to try to be very politically correct because I have a lot to say about this that maybe you and I could talk about offline. Sure. Um, I, it's free for two months right now, uh, but there's still barriers to a lot of our, our families. Um, yeah. Cox is, is working to, to, to their credit, working to remove some of uh, those barriers. Uh, one of the things we just recently found out that they're going to allow us to do, which we've been asking for, is uh, allow us to take on where needed the, the cost of uh, Wi-Fi for some of our families. So allowing us to, to, to hold those accounts, so to speak. Um, but, you know, there, there's other things that, like I said, that I, I, I don't want to do it in a public forum, but that you and okay. I could talk about and, and maybe um, brainstorm and, and I could get your advice on, on how to tackle some of these, which have been ongoing frustrations. I'd love to because I, I mean, this is such a, for, for this situation right now, people need to have connectivity. Um, 
it doesn't cost much and there's foundations, there's philanthropists, there's people would want to help. So <laughs> I just want to, I mean, 300, that's great. And I know you're working hard for each and every one and, and there's barriers. I went on the site myself. I found it really sort of challenging. So anyway, I, please let's continue this conversation and just yeah. know that I uh, think it's probably one of the most important things we can be doing right now. And, and like we just stated, this also is, you know, bodes well for the future of yeah. households that will then be connected um, in a way that um, that's helpful for their children. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Other questions on technology? Okay. Where, who's next? Thanks, Todd. It looks like food services. Food now. service. Like <clears throat> I didn't know if I was supposed to chime in or what. So um, I too would like to uh, thank our food service staff. Um, you know, we closed schools on March, what, the day March 13th and schools were ready and up and running on the 16th with a very different way of serving um, our students plus getting the word out of our students. So they did a great job. They continue to do a great job. Um, we have gone from 10 sites to 11. We added Las Flores this week. Uh, we served about 236 these past two days. And the total, uh, two day total is eight, about 8,100 meals, 8,200 8, meals. Um, this sounds like a lot, but when our average month of meals um, is much higher than that, there's about a 200,000 meals difference here. So um, we're, I just wanted to give the board a heads up that if the USDA and state does up with more money, it's going to be a challenge for our revenue this year. Um, because even though we get more money for SF, uh, S, SFSP, that's the school we're running on a summer program right now, um, we get more money in, re in reimbursement, minimally more money, but um, the amount of meals we're serving is a, a lot less. So just to give you a heads up on that, um, I'm communicating with capital advisors almost weekly. Um, in fact, I think Kevin Gordon's getting a little sick of me emailing him, but um, he's very gracious about what he's talking to, to, to get more money out of USDA and the state of California for food service. They know it's going to be a big hit all districts that are feeding their, the kids. Um, the spirits are really good. There, um, we've really had no problems with rotated kitchens. We rotate staff out of kitchens because some kitchens are bigger than others and can rotate more people out, whereas like Bean and Adams are smaller. But um, they're all really well. They just show up. They do. They come with music. They come with balloons. Um, they're dancing. They're very high energy. Um, working and keeping them um, in masks as of the executive order that came down that we have to have masks. Um, we're making them, we're purchasing them. Um, we're trying to get them out as soon as possible. If anybody wants to purchase masks, I can show you how my mom and I did yesterday. So um, yeah, let me know. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Just, yeah, Ms. Simzotin. Hi, Meg, thank you for that. So how are, uh, are this just the meals to our students who would normally be getting it through the year or does this include our contractors that still have contracts through the end of June? These are just our kids and they may not be our kids. They'd be Montecito, Cold Springs, Hope, uh, any kid. Um, we do not ask for ID. We do not ask um, for any information for Santa Barbara Unified. This is summer feed, so you can feed any any time as long as they're 18 years and not younger. This has the number of meals. We're still keeping up with our uh, vended. Um, of course, we provide for notary fuels because they're closed. 
um, they, those, those kids could be coming to one of our sites. So be in that number, I just can't tell you if they are. Um, but like CAC and anybody in, in Frankfurt and stuff, we're still providing the about the same amount of meals we've done in the past. They're not in that number. So, so that revenue part is not, I mean, it's still leveling off. I know maybe, maybe CAC is closed some of your sites, but I, I don't know. I was just, so I was just trying to ascertain the difference between uh, who's, you know, with the student uh, accessing meals versus our vendors still getting their yeah. level of service. So when I say there's a, you know, our average is about 200,000 meals a month, we're going to be adding about 33 a month if it continues it you know for two days of 8,800 mm -hmm. um, that and I'm comparing it to three three normal months October just an average them and that is just kids it has nothing to do I, I look at these things as two very separate we've got our ended and we got our kids and when when I compare I compare them each other not don't bond them. Okay, I was just trying to get get that difference. Thank you, thank you for that. Sure. So I have a question. Unless somebody else, um, just I mean, I I think I want to you know give give uh, kudos to Miss Barnwell, and we've gotten good information about the, our meals being served out in the public and on Facebook and. I've seen good, but I mean, the fact that we, we have more food and we can serve more kids and kid, this is at a time when we have massive layoffs and unemployment. Can, can we brainstorm on more things to be done? I know that plates are full, so I'm not, I'm, I'm respectful of work, but um, it does seem like uh, we, we have solutions here by the food that we can serve and other districts are, I've just heard anecdotally, you know, the school buses are driving meals around. I know that the state thankfully has loosened requirements that kids don't have to be in the car, which is excellent um, because that's certainly a challenge, especially if they're sick. <laughs> so, uh, so I just wanted to, you know, just wanted to lend my support in any way. Meg, we've talked briefly, but we could continue the conversation about, just the uh, public awareness factor that we do have fresh, good meals at a time when people really need them, even more than they did before March 13th. Yeah, I would, someone reached out to me today and asked if they had to be in, in a car, if they had to be present. And I was shocked that that question came up because the word on the street is not that. So I don't know. Um, can improve that work with Cami on that to see what we're missing there because it is going out on Parent Square so parents receiving that sure. it is on so have to brainstorm about that yeah and the media has been good but maybe there's other other ways other stories uh, that we can do especially even that piece that the ch children don't because that's a development that's at least within the last ten days or so uh, that that the children no longer have to be in the car. Right. Quickly, because it, you know, um, they don't have to be in a car. They don't walk up. They can bike up. They can. They don't have to be in a car like some people thought. So they don't have to be present. However, if somebody does come up and ask for twenty meals, I would give them. And somebody has asked that. So um, we have to respect the rules of. E on that also. It has to be, um, you know, in reason. Ms. Kat? Yes, thank you. Go for it. Thank you. I was just thinking maybe we could talk offline about it, how the county can use, you know, the public site too, how we could maybe elevate that on the because every every information with regards to COVID nineteen is really going on the public um, publichealth.org uh, website, and so maybe we can talk offline, and maybe we can draft a message that would go through you know our office of emergency management how that could then be put up you know put up there so that there's another way of you know letting folks know because a lot of folks are going through 
you know, the public health because they're looking at the COVID-19 information around there. And so while they're going there, we can perhaps maybe have something there that can, you know, do a, a further outreach as well. It's a good, good point. Okay. So we can talk offline about that and be okay. happy to kind of coordinate that. Thanks. Excellent. Okay. Any questions, further questions for on food service comments? Okay, great. Moving, moving right along here. Uh, we've got two more items in this agenda item, which is budget and finance. So that's also you, Mr. Tay, followed up with uh, human resources. Actually, uh, Ms. Caps, I'll, I'll do the budget development. And okay, great. I'm going to shorten this a lot because it's getting long and I want to, want to get our team to bed because they've got a day tomorrow. Um, it's going to be a, an interesting future financially for uh, the country, the state, our local economy. Um, I think for the short term, we'll be fine uh, as long as everybody pays their property taxes. Um, I think we will have resources to conserve because the school year essentially stopped on March what, 13th. Um, so we're going to just find every dollar that we can set aside, put it in savings and help develop next year's budget. Um, I think what we're communicating to the board is we're going to be as conservative as possible setting up the budget for really the next two years, because I think the economic seasons that we're going to face are going to be challenging. So, you know, I'm just today, just really big picture comments. Um, we'll be bringing some budget updates to you, um, probably the first board meeting in May. We hope to present a budget model for next year. So I'll stop there. Any questions? Ms. Ford. Do you think at that time you could also sort of, it, since it's sort of time with the May revise, if you could maybe give us an idea about um, where the additional um, expenditures are coming from in this year's budget, for example, hotspots, and also possibly, I would hope, some areas where we're going to save. Yeah, my goal by the um, that first uh, board meeting in May that we'll have a pretty good closing out of accounts for this year. I mean, yeah, we're, we've got some new costs, but, you know, we directed our facilities team to just shut down heat, heating pools, electricity, lights. Uh, I think we'll see some good savings there. Our travel and conferences essentially stopped. So I, I think we're going to clear some pretty significant dollars. Um, and then we'll account for new expenses. But um, I can tell you today that we're going to clear some extra cash simply because we closed schools. Um, and so we should have a number for you, hopefully by mid-May. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Uh, Dr. Becchio. All right. Um, well, on the HR front, um, the team, HR team has been spending a lot of time on just general employee issues. Um, you know, if you think about it, our working conditions have literally um, flipped themselves upside down. I mean, our contract doesn't really even represent what we're doing. So we had to, in quick order, get get some language around working conditions, leaves that are changing, our leave laws are, are, are changing um, every week seems like um, compensation evaluation. So there's a lot to consider in our, with our bargaining units, um, but just on the phone a lot and um, really dealing through individual employee issues. There's a lot of them that are surfacing around um, this situation. We are very fortunate um, to have really our great partners in our bargaining units. Um, we are definitely exercising a common purpose around, you know, the employees being our greatest asset and um, really looking out for their um, safety, well-being, and and you know just good overall working conditions. So um, I'm on the phone with with their leadership of CSEA and SPTA um, just every day. So um, just solving problems. They're a great partner in that. Um, and then the other thing that we're spending a lot of time on right now is the just reshaping our recruitment, actually not the recruitment, but the actual selection process. We have people in the queue that have gone into our system and applied for our open positions. And, and so the biggest um, concern right now is how to carry out those interviews. Um, as you know, we had a very robust interview process around performance-based protocols and 
Um, so just trying to figure out um, with this cabinet team and, and my HR team uh, how to how to make those interviews very productive for us, but um, and and um, hold on to some of those um, ideas around performance base, but do it via Zoom. So. We're going to go ahead and conduct our first one, looks like Friday, for the Santa Barbara Junior High Principal position and see how that goes. And then we're going to roll out the other, I mean, we have about six management positions right now that we have to hire. Uh, probably in the end, we'll end up hiring seven or eight because of, you know, we may have internal candidates that get positions we have to backfill those. So, um, and then we're working with our staffing frameworks team and our and our principals on, on teacher hiring or just actually teacher needs for next year. And then we'll move into how to hire for those positions since we, you know, we canceled our hiring fair and we're a little bit behind on, on knowing our exact staffing needs for 2021. So uh, we're turning a corner though. We're going to have an interview Friday. So I'm excited about that, but it's, it is a lot of work and a lot of coordination and, and um, the, the team's pulling together and supporting us on that too. So. That's my update for HR. Oops, sorry, I did that again. I was muted. Uh, any questions Dr. Be for Dr. Becchio? I'm looking at Ms. Ford, let me find Dr. Reed. There you are. You just said thumbs up. Okay, great. Okay, well, we are uh ticking away here on the clock um i think that ends the extremely important covid 19 status report um and so now we are going to move to item and i want to thank the staff that's been said but it's very important to, to reiterate just how uh much we appreciate all the creativity and the diligence okay uh moving into item g6 which is the superintendent candidate review um i so at this stage, we're going to move into closed session. Yes. But we do have one public comment um, from hopefully somebody who might have hung in there. Um, I'll turn that over to Sandra to see if if our public comment on this agenda item is um, is still relevant. Yes, we have one public comment, Caroline Cranel, and give me one second I'm trying to connect. Okay, you are you can speak to the board. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you all for your efforts to enable public comment to continue in a modified way during this unprecedented oh. time period. I'm sorry, can you turn your audio off? Yeah. Thank you. I'm really sorry. Uh, okay, perfect. Is it better now? Yes, continue. Okay. Um, thank you for your efforts to enable public comment to continue in a modified way during this unprecedented time period. My name is Corbin Cunell, and I'm a student at Dos Pueblos High School and the president of the Ethnic Studies Now Club at my school. I am honored to speak tonight on behalf of the Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara Coalition, who, in discussions with our Santa Barbara community, have determined five traits desirable in a superintendent. First, this person must have a background of close attention to the most vulnerable population. This includes students who are English language learners in special education, experiencing homelessness, and among other needs, specific needs groups. Second, the new superintendent must be committed to transformative education that encourages social justice learning. This will empower students through an understanding of how economic and political systems impact us based on class, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, abilities, system status, etc. Third, the incoming superintendent must meet the proper implementation of ethnic studies as top priority. Our superintendent must support the efforts to hire experienced ethnic studies teachers with the expansion of a more inclusive curriculum and more expansive ethnic studies course offerings. Fourth, having a superintendent to whom the majority of our students and parents can relate to and who understands the perspectives and values of our community is important. During the 2017-2018 academic school year, 67.4% of teachers in our school district were women, and 65% of our students were students of color. A social justice-oriented woman of color would provide a supportive role to our community, including our parents, teachers, staff, and students. Finally, a superintendent should prioritize 
permanent youth involvement in district decision making. This means students permanently seated on committees and boards where the mentoring of their leadership skills will boost the credibility of the established members as advocates for progressive education. This also means an elected seat on the school board for which a student will be elected by fellow students to be a voice on a board that has the people's best interests at heart. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the speaker for hanging in there so long here. So uh, just to give clarity, clarification, um, we are moving into closed session because per the Brown Act, we are talking about actual candidates and personnel uh, issues, and that's um, appropriate for a closed session discussion. So we are gonna do that, but if there's any action that's taken, we will actually come back into open session. I will say, um, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't forecast, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily likely that we <laughs> that we will. So I just want to <laughs> let people sleep if or go go on with their night if that's the case and not wait. There's not some sort of uh, anticipated um, vote or announcement uh, concluding uh, this closed session um, part of the agenda again tonight. But we are we are going to move into closed session and uh, to have a report and discussion with our search firm. Uh, Ben Johnson and Dr. Daryl Adams, who I hope are hanging in there as well uh, with the time and so that we can talk about the, their, uh, the candidate pool and person um, and um, um, candidates. So with that, I'm gonna adjourn this portion of the meeting um, and I wanna thank everybody for their patience. And uh, honestly, the fact that this moves so smoothly I know test runs were done for this, and I really appreciate Sandra. I'm looking at you and Todd and so many, so and Carrie, so much effort went into making sure that this was orchestrated as successfully as possible. And again, thanks to the public, to the fact that we had so many people participate and a few journalists be with us, it really means a lot. So I'm gonna adjourn this part of the meeting and, and move us into closed session uh, for item, let's see, that would be H7. So I don't have a gavel, but I'm, I'm, I'm adjourning us into closed session. And then we need to hang up on this Zoom meeting and get into closed session Zoom meeting. Thanks everybody. <laughs>